Welcome to the Jordan B. Peterson Podcast, episode 32 of season four. I'm Michaela. I hope everyone had a wonderful Father's Day weekend. On this episode, my dad spoke with Andrew Doyle. Andrew Doyle is a British comedian, author, playwright, journalist, a master of political satire, and the voice of Titania McGrath. Jordan and Andrew discussed his new book, Free Speech and Why It Matters, the hate crime law in Parliament, free speech and its importance, Twitter attacks, creativity, Titania McGrath's story, and more. I hope you enjoy this episode. Andrew Doyle is with me today. Andrew is a British comedian, playwright, journalist, political satirist, and author who co-created the fictional character Jonathan Pye and the equally or perhaps even more fictional character Titania McGrath. He recently published his first book, Free Speech, Why It Matters, which came out in 2021, but previously published two more as the aforementioned Titania McGrath. The first of those was Woke, A Guide to Social Justice, published in 2019. And the second was My First Little Book of Intersectional Activism, published in 2020. Uh, I haven't met Andrew before. I'm looking forward to talking with him about free speech and about his satire and about the intersection between those two and, and whatever else comes up. Thank you very much for coming on today. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me. So shall we start perhaps with a discussion of your book? I finished it yesterday. Um, I've become notorious, I suppose, for my particular take on free speech. And so it was a book that interested me. Tell me why you wrote it and, and, and what you learned and all of those things. Well, it's not the sort of book I ever envisaged that I would have to write. Um, you know, I think if you go back 10, 15 years... The idea that free speech, which is obviously what the seedbed of all our liberties, would be something that we would we would have to defend, would have probably seemed a little bit ridiculous to me because I I basically took it for granted. I thought that everyone was on on that side, um, but I fear that something has happened, uh, particularly over the past ten years or so, and it is connected. I feel with the, the rise of this social justice movement, what we might call critical social justice or however we want to call it. A lot of people call it the woke movement. What, what, however you want to label that ideology, which at, it heart, at its heart has a real mistrust of free speech. And you hear it all the time in the kind of phrases that the activists use, phrases like words are violence or, or this kind of language normalizes hate or legitimizes hate or all, all this kind of thing. And there's a real genuine mistrust of the power of language to effectively corrupt the masses. And what I wanted to do, I suppose, was uh, try and marshal a defense for this, uh, for this principle that I had always, always taken for granted, but at the same time, attempt to grapple with the concerns that people might have. Because I, 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 my worry with the culture war, as we call it, is that you have two sort of extreme poles uh, arguing against each other. And most people are caught in the middle. I think most people are broadly for the idea of free speech, but they have a few reservations, for instance, when it comes to uh, demagogues espousing hate or, or, or hate against a particular minority group or something like that. Or people are concerned about the ways in which language can cause harm. And I don't think anyone would deny that words can be hurtful. So um, most people, I think, are somewhere in between and are open to persuasion. And I think my my point, my principal argument in the book is that uh, absolute freedom of speech is always going to be better. And in fact, by uh, promoting free speech, you're doing something to help those very people that you are concerned about. So recently, the Scottish Parliament passed uh, a hate crime law that has its supporters and also its detractors. And i be interested in your feeling about that. Now, you said, I believe in this book, if, if I remember the statistics correctly, that there have been 120,000 incidents of police investigated speech hate crime in Britain in how long since it's, yeah. that's been over the last five years or so? It's, it's, it's worse than that. The, uh, the statistic I quote is between 2014 and 2019, there are 120,000 recorded incidents of non-crime 
They call them non-crime hate incidents. And this is something which is now routine in the UK. I mean, I, obviously, I'm going to be talking about the UK and the US and Canada is a very, is, is a very different kettle of fish, I'm sure. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the people who are watching won't be familiar with, with the problems we have in the UK. Of course, we don't have constitutional protection for free speech. We don't have a First Amendment. Uh, we don't have anything like that. So we are particularly vulnerable. And at the moment, unfortunately, in the UK, uh, the police who are uh, trained by the College of Policing, who do issue very specific guidelines about this. And anyone can check this because if you go to the government's website on hate crime and hate speech, uh, they make very clear what they're talking about. What they say is that there are five protected characteristics, and these fall into race, gender, sexuality, gender identity, and disability. Uh, I think I may have misquoted that, but there's one missing. But anyway, there are five protected characteristics. And if a victim, and they do use the word victim rather than complainant, if a victim uh, perceives that any speech or crime was motivated by hatred towards any of those five protected characteristics, then it qualifies as a hate crime if it's criminal. If it's not criminal, if it's just speech or something like that, it qualifies as a non-crime hate incident. Police will investigate that. They will record that. And although non-crime incidents don't lead to prosecution, they do go on a criminal reference check that many people take. We call it a, a disclosure and barring service here. So it can affect your employment prospects. Uh, and is that worrying, without a trial? That's without, recorded without a trial. So of course. There's is, no, there's so no you trial. get a quasi-criminal record. You get something flagged up, when you, uh, particularly if you're applying for a teaching job, say something like that, where you're working with children, it's very important. And you get this thing flagged up. So it does have serious ramifications. But even beyond that, we have hate speech laws, which are encoded into uh, the Public Order Act, which is one example. But the other, the main example is the Electronic Communications Act 2003. In this country, and I do quote the statistic in the book as well, we have roughly uh, 3,000 people arrested a year um, for um, offensive things that they have said online. That's that's So in other words, nine people a day, roughly, the police in the UK are arresting and it, the people in the UK will be familiar with this because if you see the Twitter accounts of various police forces, various police departments across the country, they often put things out like, you know, make sure you don't say anything offensive or thoughtless online or we will be knocking on your door. They say these very kind of frightening things. There was a, uh, a recent police um, display outside a supermarket um, in the UK. It went viral, this image. It was them next to a big digital billboard. And the, the slogan on the billboard was being offensive is an offence. And this was flanked by police officers who were socially distanced, but they were, they were there in their masks, which made it seem slightly even more sinister. Um, they got in a lot of trouble for that because people were saying, well, being offensive surely isn't a crime. Um, but actually, the problem with that is that the police clearly thought it was a crime and they, you know, they were acting on that basis. They'd obviously hadn't just concocted this billboard out of nothing. They'd really considered what, what it should say. And more to the point, actually, they were right. In this country, you can uh, go to prison for jokes, for offensive remarks, um, and people have gone to prison, have been arrested uh, routinely for, for, for causing offence. And of course, the notion of offence is incredibly subjective. In fact, in fact, the, the legal stipulation in the Communications Act is that you will have broken the law if the judge and jury deem that you have uh, communicated material that is quote unquote grossly offensive. Well, I don't know how you define that. I, I, I wouldn't well, know. And also, define who that. defines it is the real question as far right. as I'm concerned. I mean, I've looked into this legislation to some degree, and one of the things that struck me about it was that it seems to be purposefully left up to the hypothetical victim to define offense, which has become a subjective reality. If, if, and, and you can understand why that might be to some degree, because how would you define hate and how would you define offense without, especially the latter, without making recourse to someone's subjective experience? But then, of course, well, we'll delve into that in a moment. I should start with the hard question, I suppose, which is, well, clearly people can say hateful things and those things can be damaging psychologically and physiologically, I suppose, if people are stressed enough and the borderline is very difficult to identify. Um, why is it that people shouldn't just assume that you're a mean loudmouth and that they shouldn't pay any attention to you at all because you're concerned about this? I mean, which is, that's the general criticism of critics of, of hate speech, let's say. And so why in the world aren't we 
aren't the people who are putting this forward just trying to make the world a nicer place? What's the big problem here? Well, I think a lot of people do assume that I'm a mean, loud mouth. I think they assume that about most people who, who defend freedom of speech. Um, but and, and I'm sure the latter part of your question is, is absolutely right insofar as I imagine a lot of the people who are sceptical about free speech are in fact trying to make the world a better place. I don't think that's mutually exclusive. I mean, the, 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 the problem here is that the legislation as it currently stands here means that, for instance, if you say something critical about me and I perceive that it was motivated by hatred towards me uh, on the basis of my sexuality, for instance, I could phone the police and that would be recorded uh, and would appear on hate crime statistics in this in this country because it's all about perception. That word is used about five or six times within the one passage in the, in the hate crime legislation, the word perception of the victim. And again, I say victim, not complainant, which suggests a complete disregard for due process, but I suppose we can leave that aside. But the most common, the most common and the most frightening misconception I have found when it comes to people defending free speech is that they are doing so because they want to have the right to say appalling things about people uh, with no comeback whatsoever. Uh, and they want to go back to some imaginary good old days, you know, where you could just be casually homophobic and, and racist and sexist and all the rest of it. And no one would call you out for that. Now, I don't know anyone who falls into that category. And, and most people who are, um, you know, advocating for free speech are doing so precisely because they are aware that in countries where free speech protections are meagre, minorities tend to suffer the most. And in fact, there is a, 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 it seems to be a corollary to me that those who are genuinely for free speech are also for uh, equal rights and protecting the vulnerable in society. And this perception, which I really find unpleasant, this perception that if you are standing up for this most foundational of principles of for freedom of speech, if you're standing up for that, you can only be doing so if you have a nefarious motive. I mean, what a horribly pessimistic view of, of humanity. And, and, it seems to be well. It seems to be a direct derivation of the hypothesis, for example, that all Western social organizations, particularly Western, are based on power and are best conceived of as tyrannical. And so, if that's your view, why would you not assume that most use of speech is essentially an exercise of power in the service of tyranny? But then why would you assume uh, that the government in control of any particular co uh, country isn't part of that tyranny that you're describing? It, it, it seems odd to me to be um, mindful of the potential for tyranny, but then to outsource all your individual liberties to the state. It seems contradictory to me. Um, well, I guess the way that that is uh, um, elided over is by allowing the hypothetical individual victim to define the offence. Th this is the problem, though. This is. I mean, the problem I've run into, and this is why, partly why I appreciated your book, is that increasingly people are called upon to defend fundamental assumptions that were so taken for granted that virtually no one has an argument that's fully articulated at hand. Yeah. When no one questions free speech, no one has to defend it thoroughly. As soon as it's questioned, well it becomes an extraordinarily complicated problem. The same with gender identity. When it's when no one's paying attention to it, it's obvious. But as soon as you have to think it through, it becomes a, a, a rat's nest, to say the least. When I was in the UK a few years ago, I saw a number of things that I felt were disturbing. Um, you, people seem to have accepted the omnipresence of CCTV cameras to a degree that I found horrifying frankly i don't like cctv cameras i don't like the the message they portray which is that everyone is criminal enough so they should be surveyed all the time and someone needs to be watching i noticed too in london in particular that many buildings had instituted airport level security so that you had to pass through a metal detector and have your bags checked etc. while you were moving in and out of buildings. And it, it struck me as quite horrifying, given that as far as I'm concerned, Great Britain and its legal and parliamentary traditions are the epicenter or at the epicenter of Western freedoms. I mean, you could make a case for France, I suppose, but not a strong one as far as I'm concerned. Yet, this, your citizens seem to have accepted this with virtually no problem. And now, on the heels of that, we have this multiplication of 
of hate crime. This episode is sponsored by Blinkist. Blinkist is an extremely convenient app if you want to get a lot of key insights into books as quickly as possible. Blinkist is an app that takes top nonfiction books, pulls out the key takeaways, and puts them into text and audio formats called Blinks that you can learn from in about 15 minutes. I used it after reading nonfiction books to help cement the key concepts into my mind. Use Blinks to learn about how to tackle procrastination, get started on developing an idea or business, or learn a skill. They've blinked thousands of titles in 27 categories, all ready to learn from in just 15 minutes. So you can learn while washing dishes, working out, winding down, walking the dog. If you like podcasts, they've blinked those too with short casts. Podcasts in 15 minutes. Perfect. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash JBP to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off of a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash JBP to get 20% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash JBP. Your citizens seem to have accepted this with virtually no problem. And now on the heels of that, we have this multiplication of of hate crime that's as much a surprise to me as it as it is to you i mean you, you won't have seen all of the cctv cameras believe apparently they're absolutely everywhere you can't walk anywhere uh in the uk without being uh, potentially monitored um you know i'm not saying someone's watching you all the time but but things are being recorded and digitized um yeah, and it's 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 interesting to me because I remember back in the uh, in the early two thousands when the government was trying to push through its ID card scheme, and broadly speaking, the left were unanimously against it, and they didn't like this idea of living in a society where there's someone on the corner saying papers, please. No one really wanted that, um, but we've become very docile and very accepting of the idea that we need to be coddled and monitored by the state. I mean, I know there's a recent debate about vaccine passports and people seem very uh, blasé about this idea that, 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 that we might have to have uh, our ID embedded and encoded onto a card to get anywhere or to do anything. So I think there's, there's something going on there and it is connected with what you've brought up in terms of hate crime legislation. We've just become accustomed. I mean, you mentioned specifically the problem in Scotland. Uh, and and seriously, it, it relates very closely to what you're saying, because the SNP, who are the only really party with any clout in Scotland, that's the Scottish National Party. Um, and it's never a good idea, is it, when you have one political party which doesn't really have an opposition? Um, they have a, a reputation for quite nanny statish policies. You know, they, they introduced a, uh, what was it called? The named person scheme. It didn't go through in the end, but they wanted to assign every child born in Scotland with a, a state guardian. You know, they effectively didn't trust uh, the parents to raise their own kids. They have other examples, you know, minimum pricing on alcohol or a ban on two for one pizzas because they don't trust poor people uh, not to gain weight. Um, so all sorts of these sorts of policies. But in this current hate crime bill, which has just sailed through because there's no opposition. Uh, Hamza Youssef, the Justice Secretary, has pushed through, uh, he specifically included an element to this bill, which says that they can criminalise you for things you say in the privacy of your own home. I mean, that to me is, I mean, that's just a given. I would have never be- thought that anyone in this country would not consider that to be a, an incredible I- I- invasion no, on individual you can, liberty. You can make a strong case for Scotland as the uh, ground zero for many of the developing many of the concepts that undergird the entire Western notion of freedom. And to see that emerging in Scotland is absolutely well, stunningly y- terrifying y- y- as far as I'm concerned. You think of Mel Gibson with a face covered in woad shouting freedom as he's executed, you know, in, that, in Braveheart. You do think of Scotland as being associated with it. But honestly, Scotland, for some reason, and I don't know what it is, and it might be to do that it's effectively this one party state. It seems to have this incredible sense. And they've really bought into this idea uh, that unless they can police the thought, uh, the thought and speech of their citizens, then they will just run a run a mock. It's there's another element to that bill. I don't know if you know about this. There's a specific element on the bill which talks about the public performance of a play. So they've effectively said that they will criminalise uh, public performances. So say if. if it can be deemed that those performances were designed to stir up hatred. That's the formulation, stir up hatred. I'm not quite sure what that means necessarily. But the ex- when when Hamza Youssef was questioned about this in Parliament, he actually said, well, theoretically, a neo-Nazi or someone from the far right could get together with a group of actors and put on a play to to recruit people to his cause. 
And as I said at the time, you know, I don't know any neo-Nazis, but they're not into amateur dramatics. That's not their thing. They don't do that. They wouldn't get involved. And yet he's got this idea in his head that that is a feasible. I mean, it seems ridiculous, but it's not really because the ramifications are quite, are quite serious. And, and, it, and the way it's just gone through without any opposition really, really uh, troubles me. I mean, there have been modifications. I should say in fairness, in the initial bill, in the initial draft of the bill, they had said that you could be criminalized irrespective of intention. In other words, yes, if you that wrote was terrifying, awful. I mean, you know, if you wrote a play that then stimulated someone to to join the far right, then you were still responsible whether you intended it or not. Now, the problem was, you know, with theatrical representation or any kind of artistic representation, is sometimes you want to represent the worst aspects of humanity um, because that's part of, of of drama and and literature and all the rest of it. I mean, you would be there would be no artistic freedom if that went through. So, fortunately, that element of the bill was modified. Well, and also the attempt to reverse the idea that intent is important is that's even that's even I mean, more uh, catastrophic. It it's always been a miracle to me that our legal system ever became psychologically sophisticated enough so that intent rather than outcome was what mattered. Because mm -hmm. you have to be a sophisticated thinker to see that someone has done damage to someone else, but and so the damage is real and marked and and troublesome and costly, all of that painful. But because the intent wasn't there, the severity of the action is dramatically mitigated. That's a sign of maturity and sophistication to note that. And the fact that it's built into the legal system is nothing short of remarkable. And then to remove that and to make the, the felt consequences, the, the arbiter of the reality of the situation is a dreadful assault on the integrity of the law as such, as far as I can tell. Well, moreover, it's something that everyone in, in, in intuitively understands. We all understand the difference between murder and manslaughter. You know, we all understand that intent actually does, like you say, it, it escalate the uh, the severity of a crime. And 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 it's and it's it's bigger than that, isn't it? It's because this this idea that intention doesn't matter is actually built into so much of this what we call social justice discourse. If you think of critical race theory, uh, it's just a given uh, that there are racist structures and you can be racist without intending to be racist. And I really do dispute that because I think in order to be racist, intention has to be at the heart of that. Otherwise, it's incoherent to me. Um, but but this is this is really uh, a degraded view of humanity, uh, I feel, where we are effectively like marionettes um, and that we, we're just being played and, and that we don't have any agency anymore. And therefore, uh, we can't be responsible for our own words, not not just our actions. We can't be responsible for our own words and their and the ramifications. So we have to be controlled and we have to be stifled by the state. And it's very, it makes me very nervous. So I've been thinking through um, the importance of free speech, I suppose, from a psychological perspective. And it seems to me that, well, we can walk through some axioms and you can tell me what you think about them if you would. So. I mean, the first thing we might posit is that it's useful to think. It's better to think than not to think. And that might seem self-evident, but but thought can be troublesome and, and stir up trouble and your thoughts can be inaccurate. So it's perhaps not that um, unreasonable to start the questioning there. But I think it was Alfred North Whitehead who said that thinking allows our thoughts to die instead of us. And so he was thinking about the evolution of thought in some sense from a biological perspective. So imagine a creature that's incapable of thought has to act something out, a representation of the world or an intent. It has to be embodied. And then if that fails, well, it fails in action. And so the consequence of that might be death. It might be very severe. Whereas, once you can think, you can represent the world abstractly, you can divorce the abstraction from the world, and then you can produce avatars of yourself, sometimes in image, like in dreams, let's say, or in literature and fiction and movies and so on, produce avatars of ourselves that are fictional, and then run them as simulations in the abstract world and observe the consequences. And we do that in our stories, we do that when we dream, we do that when we imagine in images and depict a, a dramatic 
scenario playing itself out. But then we also do that in words because we encode those images. It's one more level of abstraction. We encode those images into words and those words become partial dramatic avatars. And then the words can battle with one another. So thought seems to work. Let's say verbal thought. You ask yourself a question. You receive an answer in some mysterious manner. There's an internal revelation of sorts. That's the spontaneous thought. You know, when you sit down to write a book, thoughts come to you, perhaps because you pose yourself a question. And no one knows how that works, but we experience it, that thoughts manifest themselves in the theater of our imagination. So that's the revelatory aspect. And then there's the critical aspect, which is, well, now you've thought this and perhaps you've written it down. Can you generate counter positions? Are, are there universes that you can imagine where this doesn't apply? Are there situations where it doesn't apply? Are there better ways of formulating that thought? And But I would say with regard to critical thought and to some degree with regard to productive thought, an indeterminate proportion of that is dependent on speech. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to point out that thought is internalized speech. And that the dialectical process that constitutes critical thinking is internalized speech. So you and I are engaging in a dialectic enterprise. You'll posit something and I'll respond to it and you'll respond to that. And we're, we're, we're in a kind of combat. There's some cooperation about it as well. And we're attempting to formulate a truth more clearly, at least in principle, if we're being honest. We do that when we're speaking. So our thought the quality of our thought is actually dependent on our ability to speak our minds. Absolutely. And then, could, so go ahead. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more because I think speech is the way in which we collaborate on our thoughts. You know, that, that's how it, how it works. You, you refine those thought processes that you've described. I mean, I'm no, I'm no psychologist, but I understand this basic premise that, that it, it, we have these various thoughts that are con continually in conflict within ourselves unless we're able to articulate them and to engage in others through that process, through that transactional process of speech. Uh, then those thoughts are never refined and they remain in this kind of infancy. And this is yes, why well, they're, all, they're as refined as we can make them as individuals. Sure. Uh, but that's also assuming that you even have the words, which you also learned in a dialectical process. Right, exactly. It's, it's not as though the truth is ever uh, fully graspable, but we can, we can get nearer to it through that collaborative process of speaking and articulating the thoughts. And in fact, even in the act of, like you say, writing or articulating yourself, uh, it, as with your self-authoring program, for instance, the act of writing things out uh, is what clarifies the, the points of view for you. I've actually found that the, 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 the way that I think about these issues now is largely a product of, of the fact that I've written so much about it. And change my mind through the act of learning how to express myself on, on these points, and 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 the and the consequence of not having that that opportunity, I think is uh, something I would barely want to contemplate. And I think that the, to give an example of of of, uh, of the moment, which is that because any kind of attempt to have a discussion or debate about the perceived conflict between trans rights and gender critical feminism, because to even attempt that discussion at the moment will have such uh, grave social consequences. And certainly uh, in terms of career prospects, major consequences, people will not have that discussion. I have people I know in politics, in the media, and they, they say to me quite honestly, I will not talk about this. I have concerns. I have qualms. I want answers to questions, but I absolutely will not open my mouth about this. And if you don't do that, uh, th this is why no one understands the issue. This is why no one has reached any kind of consensus on this issue. All we have is a sense in which to have the quote unquote wrong opinion makes you a pariah. Uh, and therefore I'd better not have that opinion. Well, then that's not a sincerely held conviction. That's just, that's well, just. The, if the definition of wrong is continually transforming and in an unpredictable manner, then it's best just to sidestep the issue entirely. And then exactly. that leaves it murky and ill-defined and, and assuming that you believe that thought has any utility. And so when you're sitting down to write, or when I'm sitting down to write and I produce a sentence, you know, it might have come from some theoretical perspective. Maybe I'm approaching something from a Freudian perspective or a Marxist perspective or a um, or a, uh, an enlightenment perspective, et cetera. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a psychological trope, I suppose, that 
we all think the thoughts of dead philosophers, right? We think we have our own opinions, but that's really rarely, very, very, very rarely the case. It's not that easy to come up with something truly original and generally make incremental progress at best. And so your ability to abstractly represent the world and then to generate avatars that can be defeated without you dying is dependent on your incorporation of a multitude of opinions. And that in itself is a consequence of I mean, that works to the degree that communication is actually free and that you can get access to as much thought as you can possibly manage. So yeah. I can't see how you can deny the centrality of free speech as a fundamental right or the fundamental right, perhaps, unless you simultaneously deny the utility of thought. But maybe if you are also inclined to remove the individual from the central position of the political discourse, then maybe you can also make the case, at least implicitly, that individual thought doesn't matter and that mostly it's just causing trouble. But I think individual thought is key. And actually, even in the, 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 the outline you've described there, there is, an, there is individual agency in reaching a conclusion that has been articulated before, insofar as if you are engaged with a multitude of writers and philosophers and artists and ideas, and you've come out with a perspe perspective, well, it, that perspective may not be original to you, but the process that you've gone through to reach that viewpoint is individual to you. It, you know, it, it, there is a power in that. So there's something important about that. You know, I no, very there's much something crucial. It's if, yeah. if you're a practicing yeah. psychotherapist, one of the things you have to learn is to not provide people with your words too much. Hmm. What you want is for them to formulate the conclusion. And yes. you can guide them through the process of investigation. You talked about the self-authoring process, and which is online at selfauthoring.com, that it steps people, say, through the process of writing an autobiography, of analyzing their current virtues and faults, and of making a future plan. The utility of all of that is dependent on the the person who's um, undertaking the exercise, generating their own verbal representations, right? Yes. And, and that seems to cement it somehow as yours, if you've come up with the words. And so it's the, it's the uppermost expression of personhood, the ability to have the words that you should speak reveal themselves to you and to have the right to express them as you see fit. Yes, in which case, if you if you are merely re repeating an accepted script, then then to what extent can you say to can you even say to be an individual at all? You know, th th this this to me. Well, is I think that's part of the philosophical conundrum: is that if you believe that all people do is repeat predigested scripts, especially if your view is that the fundamental human motivation is power, mm. and the entire social landscape is nothing but a competition between equally what would you say selfish and single-minded power strivers then there is no individual there's no individual in that conceptual world and it seems to me that that's the world that we're being pushed to inhabit and are criticized for on moral grounds for criticizing and Absolutely. i'm still trying to get my hands around this i mean when i went to britain i saw the CCTV cameras and the increased security. And it isn't clear to me how that's related to the social justice issues that so-called social justice issues that we're discussing, but they seem to me in some very difficult to comprehend way, part and parcel of the same thing, the same dangerous thing. Well, I think it's probably connected just in terms of this dis distrust of humanity or this belief that, that um, people need to be shepherded uh, other otherwise left to their own devices uh, chaos will reign. I think that's, I think that's the connection. It's not directly connecting as far as the, the issues relating to liberty and CCTV obviously predate, uh, what we now call whatever the current social justice movement is called. Uh, but I think there is, there is something there. I mean, the, the, the censorship, the, the, the impulse to censor what people read, uh, and, and this is something that particularly hits home to me in the arts, uh, is based on this view that ultimately it's the people are, the, or the populace is uh, liable to corruption if they're exposed to the wrong materials. And, and what's very interesting to me about that, I mean, you've written a lot about the way in which 
literature, uh, for instance, in, in, informs our experiences because it is in a sense, like when you read philosophers, you're, you're, you're feeling your way through other lives and other experiences that are trans-historical and cross-cultural, and they inform the way that you react in your own individual experience. But if you start to say as an artist, no, you can only represent for a start, what you personally are or have experienced. Uh, and you cannot represent anything which is morally problematic, to use the phrase that they absolutely adore. Uh, then art fails to, and literature in particular, fails to uh, function in the way that it should, because you can't explore the, those things. This is why I often, when it, terms, when it comes to censorship of the arts, I often go back to what Oscar Wilde said about this. He said, there's no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well-written or badly written. That is all. And that, and that actually art and morality, uh, sometimes are not one. It, in other words, art shouldn't just be about promoting whatever the, uh, uh ethical trend is of any given time. It's much bigger. Well, it's than not that. art at that point at all. Well, it's as far as I'm concerned, if you, if you can state the purpose of the art, in explicit terms, especially if it's in accordance with a, uh, let, let's say, a, an ideology that's shared by a multitude of people, it's not art at all. It's propaganda. Well, it's it's totally banal. I mean, this is why so many people are getting sick of Hollywood. I mean, to bring it down to a different level, that people are, are sick of the entertainment on their TV, on their streaming services and on Hollywood, because they have this constant feeling that they're being hectored by some moralistic person in a, in a studio saying, you know, we our focus here is on diversity. Our focus here is on uh, um, uh, the right moral message, that the, the, the message of the story is one that would be approved by a group of intersectional activists. And you get this all the time seeping into mainstream entertainment and people get really, really sick of it. It's not that when you see a, a lesbian kiss in Star Wars that that offends you because you're a homophobe. Uh, most most sci-fi fans, are they've never had a problem with diversity or anything like that. What bothers them about it is this sense of someone saying to them, we think you're all evil bigots and you need to be educated. And that's why we're going to shoehorn in uh, a lesbian kiss into the end of this film. That's why people have a, a problem. I mean, you, you had it yourself recently with that ludicrous Marvel comics thing where you became the Red Skull. Uh, and that to me was a perfect example of the banality of uh, an artistic endeavor that becomes an exercise uh, in political pedagogy, because that was quite clearly I mean, you, you couldn't even say it was satirical because it, it, it cannot be satirically effective if the thing that they are comparing you to is the precise opposite of the thing you believe. I mean, of, of all the sort of public figures I can think of, you have uh, the, the most clear track record of opposing tyranny in all its forms, which anyone who knows anything about your work will know. <laughs> You've spent years lecturing about the evils of authoritarianism, including Nazism. So the idea that you would then become this ma super magic Nazi is is... It's propagandistic. It's, 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 it's totally banal artistically. Firstly, you can't, you, it's not satirically, right? Um, but also it's just, it's just, it's just, you know what it reminds me of? Actually, I don't know if you, if you remember after the fatwa against Salman Rushdie, um, there was a, a film made in Pakistan called International Gorillas, where they turned Salman Rushdie into this evil, um, villain playboy who was colluding with the, Israeli military services. And at the end of the film, these flying copies of the Quran float down and shoot laser beams into his head and kill him off. But, it, and that is such a ridiculous, laughable film. You know, you put your enemy as the main villain and you just misrepresent him in that way. Well, that's just what they did to you. It's as banal as that. And that's, I think people are sick of that. Well, the response thankfully seems to indicate that, you know, it didn't, that people it, it didn't do me any harm, as far as I no. can tell. I, I mean, it was very um, shocking to me that it happened. It took me about 12 hours to sort of regain my composure because I actually couldn't believe it to begin with. I, I was sure that it was a, a, a fabrication, yeah. it, especially, but then what, it was even more shocking when I found out who, who had authored it. You know, it wasn't, it was someone who had an intellectual reputation. And so... But he's an activist, isn't he? He's he's a he's an intersectional activist. He definitely his opinions definitely place him on the radical, on the side of the radical left. So it, it it's very difficult to so there's there, there's a there's an attack on, on the essence of free speech. I mean, I remember reading Derrida. Derrida criticized our culture, Western culture, as phallogocentric. Yeah, and it's really actually quite a precise word. So the phallic part of it is masculine, obviously related to the phallus, to the, and 
logos is, well, that's the central concept of Greek rationalism, but it's also the central concept of Christianity. And the logos is something like the magical power of genuine and true speech. It's something like that. And there are representations of the magical power of speech that predate Greece and Christianity. You mm. see it in Mesopotamia, the, this, the, the equivalent to the Savior in ancient Mesopotamian uh, religious thinking was Marduk, and he could speak magic words. He had eyes all the, round, all the way around his head, which meant that he paid attention to everything, but he could speak magic words. And, um, and, and so that idea of the, of the centrality of speech to the, and its association with the very fabric of reality, that, that's been an idea that has strived to make itself manifest for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the biblical tradition, the word is given cosmological status as the thing that brings habitable order out of chaos and it's identified with divinity itself and so the assault on free speech is an assault on a principle that's fundamental beyond say its centrality its central importance to the enlightenment and is it, it, it it's it's an assault on the on the idea of the logos itself mm. i agree and this is why i always mistrusted the 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 post-structuralists. So when I was studying for English, it, it was the Derrida and Foucault and Lyotard, and these were taken as a given. And this idea that there's no, there is no truth beyond language. You know, language is all. Language is the way in which we construct our perception of reality and our perception of truth. And and that actually there is no truth at the heart of it. I just found it so depressing, <laughs> depressingly pessimistic because it also means that you construct can construct any kind of reality you like. And it and and it well, also and maybe that's part of the motivation for it is the yeah. the the hypothetical lack of constraint by anything that that seems to imply right i mean if there's no canonical reality well there's no responsibility that's for sure you could argue that there's no meaning and it's deeply pessimistic but maybe the payoff for that is no responsibility but there's also no constraint of any sort there's certainly no ethical constraint and i mean i keep trying to dig to see what's at the bottom of this uh this anti logo sentiment and it, it's a very it's a very difficult thing to make to, to maybe get it's right. not even, maybe it's not even as deliberate as, as the way that it sounds M maybe it is just the fact that the, that these theories for whatever reason became fashionable in universities about 20 years ago and now for whatever reason they have um escaped into the mainstream and and you know i mean most of the people that push this stuff don't read Foucault and they don't know about the, the, the people whose ideas they've, they've imbibed and actually very much misunderstood. You know, I mean, the, the whole point of the postmodernist was to, 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 to trash the notion of grand narratives. And what we have now in the social justice movement is an incredible grand narrative. You know, we are, we are on the right side of history. We are the righteous ones and everyone else needs to be, uh, you know, decimated. And it's, it's, it, 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 it seems to me, that this stuff, I, d I don't think it's as conspiratorial as that. I think it's just sort of circumstances of history, one thing after another. And this is where we, we're at now. But the end result that we have to deal with, which I think you've alluded to, is this idea that if there is no such thing as reality beyond language, then you are at liberty to dis to construct whatever uh, a pseudo reality that you desire or it is easiest for you. And we see elements of this reverberating, I think, in a lot of the discourse at the moment of things like lived experience. You know, you can present as much data as you want, but it will be disregarded if it doesn't tally with what lived experience really means, which is what I want to be true. Or well, what there's I also this insistence that seems part of it that, I mean, I, I objected to some legislation that was passed in Canada, and that's sort of what propelled me into public visibility, let's say. Mm. And to begin with, I was mostly concentrating on the violation of the principle of free speech that the legislation seemed to me to represent because it compelled certain utterances. And I was never a fan of hate speech laws to begin with. And, and th this was something beyond hate speech laws because hate speech laws stop you from saying things, whereas compelled speech laws force you to say something, which is much worse, even though the first one is also inadvised, ill-advised as far as I'm concerned. But I, 
I've realized more recently that I was also disturbed, although in a less explicit manner, with the theory of identity that was an implicit part of the legislation. So mm -hmm. with gender identity, for example, and we're engaged in a discussion across our culture about gender identity. I mean, I know as a personality psychologist that there are females, biological females who have masculine personalities, and there are biological males who have feminine personalities, that the link between personality as such and, and biological structure is suggestive, but not absolute. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of variability. Um, but the idea that identity is something that you define yourself, and that you can change at will at any point seems to me to be entirely counterproductive and dangerous because it's inaccurate. So your identity isn't merely your membership in whatever group you happen to identify with at that moment. It's certainly not merely your sexuality or merely your race. In fact, your identity is barely your race because your identity is something more like how you conduct yourself in the world. Yes. And if you define yourself as black, let's say, that doesn't give you much of a map to encountering and approaching the world. It's no, nowhere near detailed enough. Mm. And, and then the idea that you define it, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. You never define your identity by yourself. You can't because you're surrounded by other people and they have to play along with you. And if they don't play along with you voluntarily, which means they appreciate the quality of your game and they understand it, then you're either going to be alienated or you have to impose your identity by force. But that's also not a very good solution. I mean, I just spent some time interviewing one of the world's foremost authorities on aggression, and that'll be released in, in, a, in a bit. Perhaps it's been released before this will be released. Um, he's done longitudinal studies of aggression. And if the idea that our social structures are predicated on power was true, then children would start out not being aggressive and they would become more aggressive with time. And the more aggressive children would be more successful. And none of that is true. Children start out more aggressive than they are on average, by the time they're adults, aggressive, aggression levels decrease with age rather than increasing. And there's no evidence whatsoever that it's a, a useful long-term strategy in the social world. Identity is something you negotiate the way you negotiate a game. Yeah. It's more like, it has to be that way. And so this is, there's something rather sinister, isn't there, about the way in which present day identity politics is about imposition onto others. Uh, rather than a, an assertion of who who I am or, or whatever that might be. I mean, I, I always mistrusted it. And so I can see the the uh, utility of identity politics, politically speaking, uh, in, in scenarios where people are marginalised. You know, I understand why gay people collectively came together back in the 60s to fight for their rights, because there was a, a, obviously a serious problem, or the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland in the 60s and 70s and that kind of thing, uh, where Catholics weren't able to, to have the vote or to get housing. So that sort of makes sense to me. The current identity politic, or what we might call identitarians, a lot of it strikes me as about as about power. In fact, I feel like they would be an incredible subject for Foucault if he were alive today, because I've noticed this correlation, and a lot of people have noticed this correlation, and I never get an answer about this. But why is it whenever online, whenever I'm viciously attacked or threatened, something particularly pernicious, the person doing it always has their pronouns in their bio or a rainbow gay flag in their bio. Why is there a correlation that I've experienced again and again? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost inevitable at this point between, uh, the need to self identify in terms of sexuality and gender and a kind of cruelty or viciousness or a need to attack an aggression. Well, in one, other words. Of, one of the things that, that disturbs me constantly about ideological representations of of the world, broadly speaking, is that their fundamental danger is that they always contain a too convenient theory of evil and malevolence. Mm -hmm. And for me, 
any theory that locates the fundamental problem of evil somewhere other than inside you is dangerous. Now, that isn't to say that social structures can't be corrupted and aren't corrupt. It's that's an existential problem in and of itself. It's it's always the case that our social institutions aren't what they should be and they're outdated and they're predicated to some degree on deceit and people who use power can manipulate them sometimes successfully. That problem never goes away and it never will. But the when when the evil can be easily located somewhere else, then you have every moral right to allow your unexamined motivations to manifest themselves fully because you can punish the evildoers and always remain on the moral side of the fence. I There's think, a huge attractiveness in that. I think, I mean, this is something you've explored a lot with the idea of, um, of Solzhenitsyn's idea about the good and evil cutting through the heart of every human, every human being, because that, that to me, uh, it really gets to the heart of a lot of, of of what I would call a kind of infantile culture. I think this is a symptom of of of, of childishness. You know, w w whenever I was learning about literature and, and 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 what constituted more sophisticated literature and what didn't, Disney films, childish films. Let's take Tolkien for instance. Good people look uh, sorry, bad people look bad. They look like orcs. They're ugly, and there are villains, and then there are heroes, and they are good. There isn't complexity, and if you have a more complex novel like a Mervyn Peake novel where people aren't necessarily good or bad they're both they struggle within themselves and with other people that is a mark of a kind of adult novel as opposed to a a childish novel right and that, that that's quite an important distinction and I think most of the political and ideological battles that I find myself in the middle of and I'm sure you do as well are because people are just reducing everything to this binary of good versus evil and putting themselves on the side of good it it, it is a very infantile almost um almost like a caricature of religion, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, and I see it again and again, we had it in this country with the Brexit vote, effectively, what happened in the vote here, and the reason why it became so toxic and, and families fell apart, and you know, you wouldn't believe, I know it wasn't reported very much elsewhere, but it was like a kind of ideological civil war here, but not a very sophisticated one, because it came down to this narrative that if you voted to leave the EU, you were evil, racist, stupid, and if you voted to remain, you were, you were good and progressive and, and all the rest, and noble and virtuous, right? And of course, there are all sorts of good reasons to have voted either way, and and this kind of caricature, and it happens again with. Well, with you all the described you described it as a caricature of 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 religion, and I think that's what an ideology is, and this is one of the reasons that I've been inclined, let's say, to go to have my shot at the rational atheists, much as I'm a fan of Enlightenment thinking. I mean, I was convinced as a consequence of reading Jung. As primarily, but also Dostoevsky and also Nietzsche, primarily, and Solzhenitsyn, I would say, as well. That, And then biology as well, as I studied that more deeply. There's no escaping a religious framework. There's no way out of it. And you, if you eliminate it, say, as a consequence of rational criticism, what you inevitably produce is its replacement by forms of religion that are much less sophisticated. I mean, let, well, it's not religion. It's it's a it's a fundamentalist. Really. It's you know, if I look back to my Catholic upbringing, actually acknowledging you, acknowledging your own capacity for sin is at the heart of Catholicism. That's why we have the confessional. That's why you sit there and tell this stranger all these things you've done wrong because, right. because well, it's and, reckoning that, with it. That, well, that and that's that's far from trivial. It's unbelievably not trivial. And because it was so common, like a common part of Catholicism, it can be passed over without notice. And so religious, the religious structures that we inherited, I'm going to talk about Christianity most specifically because it's the dominant form of, it's the, it's the form of religious belief that primarily undergirds our social structures. It's our operating system. I, my producer came up with that term the other day, and I thought it was apt. Um, and it does localize the drama between good and evil inside hmm. and makes you responsible for that and and makes you in, encourages you, let's say, to attend to the ways that you fall short of the ideal. And when you criticize a structure like that out of existence, you don't criticize the questions that gave rise to it out of existence. And the questions might be, well, 
What's the nature of the good? What's the nature of evil? Those are religious questions. What's the purpose of our life? Uh, how do you orient yourself if you're trying to move up, let's say, rather than down? Hmm. Um, how should you conduct yourself, et cetera, et cetera? Those questions don't go away and they can't not be answered. And so the way that a, a traditional religious structure answers them is in a mysterious way. It uses ritual, it uses music, it uses art, it uses literature, it uses stories, all these things that are outside the realm of easy criticism. And then some of that's translated into you know, comprehensible, explicit dogma, and that's the part that's most susceptible to rational criticism. But when that disappears, I've been thinking about this a lot this week because of what happened to Richard Dawkins recently. You know, and I have my differences with Dawkins and the rest of the rational atheists because I think that they underestimated the danger of dispensing with what they were attempting to dispense with. And hmm. I see the influx of religious fervor associated with political ideas as a direct consequence of of the lack of separation let's say between church and state psychologically but but dawkins has fallen foul of this new religion but a religion but his case actually really is t is testimony to what we're talking about that this is not a religion in a traditional sense it is an infantile religion that only sees things in binaries of good and evil because he was effectively he was posing a question about identity. He was saying, if it is possible for Rachel Dolezal to identify as black, why is she universally uh, condemned and derided? Uh, but somebody can identify as the opposite sex and they are celebrated. And all he was doing was posing the question. He wasn't even actually um, making a, a claim. Yeah, well, he was there. doing he was doing what a scientist actually does. I mean, I've been shocked <laughs> frequently in my interactions with journalists because I've worked as a scientist for three decades, and I'm accustomed to the way that scientists think and speak. And when I'm sitting around with my graduate students, and there's a problem or an issue, what they do, and my colleagues as well, is generate a bunch of hypotheses about why that might be. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. believe them, but the, the first trick is to generate as many, um, what would you say, hypotheses, I said that already, that might account for it, ranging from biological through social, etc., and that is exactly what Dawkins did. He that even put, that, said that's what he was doing. That puts you on the side of the devil. I mean, there, there was a, a viral tweet this week from a, a teacher saying, I will never allow my pupils to play devil's advocate. I will never allow that in the class because some some views are oppressive and are, and, and are not to be entertained. I mean, th th but that's the point. That's why the Vatican will call in a devil's advocate when someone is potentially being canonized. Well, if you can't play devil's advocate, you can't you think. That's it. You you have to have devil a devil's advocate in your head. If you don't have a devil's advocate in your head torturing every thought you generate, you're not you're not engaged in critical thinking. Right. But that's, that's for sure. That's the scientific process to disprove yourself. I mean that's that's what surprises me about uh Richard Dawkins' response because I think what he didn't realize is that he was caught in this good versus evil binary and he had he had he was the heretic now. Uh, he had been branded. He posed the question you're not, you're not meant to pose. Uh, and therefore he's, he's now outed himself as one of the demons. He's there in pandemonium with the other demons. Now, the, so he did, but then he of course backtracked and apologized and said, well, I didn't want to offend anyone. And of course, in a, in a, in an adult rational world, that would be taken in good faith and, and what, but he didn't, I don't think he fully appreciates what's going on here is that he's already uh, marked himself as the well, sinner. Well, here's his, here's his apology, let's say. Now, what he should have said, as far as I'm concerned, here's what he said. Okay. Um, I do not intend to disparage trans people. I see that my academic disgust question has been misconstrued as such, and I deplore this. It was also not my intent to ally in any way with Republican bigots in the U.S. now exploiting this issue. And so okay. it's so interesting that that's what he did because. Well, it's buying into the he, tribalism thing, you know, well, it, 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 it's also it's it's not a, it's not the best response for the, to defend him. What he should no. have said was something like, look, people, <laughs> here's something to think about that I was posing. That's what scientists do. And. You didn't understand that, but that's not my problem. It's your lack of sophistication. But he, instead of saying that, he 
immediately removed himself from the bad people. And that was the Republican bigots, which yeah. just seems to me to pour fuel on the fire. And and then he also said that he didn't intend to disparage trans people, which isn't the issue at all. Well, there also, there's, there, there was no implication in what he asked that he had ever intended to disparage trans people. But to be fair to him, to be fair to him, I understand when you're caught in the middle of a Twitter storm, you, you just want it to stop. And I've heard you talk about this as well. It's actually your response probably isn't going to be the best, the best one. You just want it to go away. No, Well, look, and, I mean, one of the things that's really worth pointing out here, and I, it's not like I don't have sympathy for Dawkins. I have sympathy for Dawkins. I sent out a tweet defending him yesterday. I mean, Dawkins is an admirable scientist in my estimation. I learned lots from reading his books. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have my criticisms of Dawkins, but just because you have criticisms of someone doesn't mean that they've never done anything worthwhile right. or that you haven't <laughs> learned something from them. And that's especially true in the scientific realm. Um, I just don't understand why. OK, so back to the Twitter issue. So what I've seen repeatedly, and, and this is worth some discussion, is when I'm watching Twitter, when I'm watching these attacks on people, what I've seen, the most general pattern of response to be is that it doesn't take very many people attacking you on Twitter before it's seriously psychologically disturbing. Yeah. You know, and, th and that is interestingly related to this whole issue of hate speech that we've been discussing, because it is the case that vicious attacks have a quite a pronounced psychological effect, especially if they're personal. And people generally fold and apologize instantly if my, my sense has been if the Twitter mob is 20 people. It's sort of like they're reacting to 20 of their neighbors showing up on their doorsteps with pitchforks and and um, torches. And yeah. I think it's it's actually an admirable response in some sense because a well socialized person actually does care what their neighbors think. And if you offend 20 of your neighbors, it's possible 20 of your tribe, it's possible that you've done something wrong, you might ask yourself that now on Twitter, you're connected to hundreds of 1000s of people. And if you would offend 20, it's not clear what that means. It might just mean that you said something. It feels a lot worse than it actually is as well. It feels amplified because there's all these people who are strangers who know absolutely nothing about you. Uh, and it's particularly frustrating because more often than not, when it's happened to me, it's, it's always been uh, an imagined grievance. It's not actually something I've said. It's something that they've assumed that I've said or, or, or the, a way that they have interpreted this. And, and the more you try and fight back against it or try and explain your actual position, the more they double down on their, you know, the, uh, and you've had this as well. People are going after a figment of their own imagination. That's impossible to fend off, you know, uh, and and it does do psychological harm. And I've never denied that. And this is something I addressed in the book because I, I, I quoted, I can't remember her name now, but the writer talking about how hate speech uh, could be said to be violence insofar as the psychological impact can have, it can have a physiological impact. It can make you sick. It can make you unwell, the, the impact of words. But of course that, well, the example I use is, uh, is taxation. I could become, fall physically sick because I'm under stress from being overly taxed by the government. Does that mean that the government has committed an act of violence against me? It could be applied to absolutely anything, I think. Uh, well, an, an arc anarchist would argue yes. Right, sure, exactly. But, but that wouldn't be me. Um, and, but, there, but you could apply that to absolutely any conceivable scenario where anything that has happened to you has led to uh, stress and, and, and physical uh, degeneration. And so I don't think it's right to single speech out and say speech is, that, but we can well, say that also, that is also it's a, it's a one sided argument because dangerous as speech free speech is, we don't ever have to deny that there's such a thing as hateful speech or damaging speech yeah. or corrosive speech or untruth speech or pathological speech in, in every possible direction. That isn't the issue. The issue is what's more dangerous to regulate it or to leave it be despite its dangers. Right. That's exactly. the only rational that's argument, the, question. the only e complete argument, let's say. E even if you have the most uh, repugnant character who is advocating the most vile ideas about society and attempting to proselytize even someone who's attempting to recruit people to his or her cause, um, even something as vicious as neo-Nazism or something like that, the question isn't, you know, do I support what that person is saying? Because obviously we don't. The question is, do you take a few instances of people behaving in this way 
uh, and use that as a reason, a justification to empower the state to make a decision about what people can say and think. That's the bigger principle that's at, at stake here. I worry that with, with, with social media and Twitter as well is that we, we end up buying into the illusion that there are more hateful people in the world than there actually are. Because even the people who send these hateful things probably wouldn't behave like that in real life. There's something about the online world. And what it does is absolutely, I mean, this is the heart of cancel culture. This is why it works. Like you said, it's just a few tweets. That's all it takes. I've seen situations where companies and corporations will backtrack on a policy just because of one or two tweets, because they fear this, this deluge of, 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 of people. They, it has such disproportionate power. And often with this, this kind of cancel culture, it is often about something that someone hasn't even said. The example of Dawkins is, is perfect because a lot of the people and some prominent people I saw were saying, look, Dawkins has now outed himself as a transphobe. If you said to, his, <laughs> if you said to them, where you, is the transphobic him today, thing? You tomorrow, bucko. Well, quite, because if, if someone is transphobic simply because you've decided that, you know, I mean, it was the same with JK Rowling. Uh, it became suddenly quite normal for commentators on the mainstream media to say that she has said transphobic things. Well, where? Because I've read her comments and her essay uh, on the trans issue that she posted on her blog. And it was a long uh, essay, which was very compassionate and nuanced. And at no point, it's the opposite. She says that she supports trans rights and she would stand there against any discrimination. If you, and I've been in these fights all the time. If ever you ask someone to say, can you just quote the transphobic thing that she said? They never can. And an adult would say, okay, I can't find the evidence of my preconception, so therefore I should revise my view. But they don't. They 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 double down on it, and they find these sort of they use casuistry and whatever linguistic uh, semantic tricks they can to come back round to the to the conclusion they'd already decided. Same with with Dawkins. I mean, the, not just the American Humanist Association. I saw a major blogger saying that anyone who is defending him is transphobic. And like, well, that, if that's all it takes to be smeared in this way, if it doesn't matter what you say. If all that matters is what people decide that you believe, then then I suppose this goes back to this pseudo reality we were discussing. Well, that actually... I guess what what Dawkins got in trouble for, let's take it apart a bit, OK, because okay. it's worth it's worth doing. He said this is his original tweet in 2015, Rachel Dolezal, a white chapter president of NAACP, was vilified for identifying as black. Some men choose to identify as women and some women choose to identify as men. You will be vilified if you deny that they literally are what they identify as. Discuss. Okay, so he put forth a set of propositions, but the proposition has a point. And the point is, what is it that you can and can't identify with? And what, what power do people have to enforce their decision on others? And that's really that's really the question he's asking if you strip it down. And that is actually a question that's very threatening to. Well, let's see, who would it be threatening to? Well, it would be threatening to anyone who insists that you can choose an identity, say, in the realm of, of gender, and that you should have the right to enforce your choice despite other people's opinions, let's say. So he's, he's asking why is there an inherent contradiction in the intersectional discourse? Why is it? Uh, why is it that racial identity is not malleable and in fact has to be strictly policed? Hence why we have all these debates about cultural appropriation. Why is that so rigid? And yet, even if the lived experience, let's go back to that, the lived experience of the person tells them otherwise. I mean, Rachel Dolezal wrote a whole book uh, in which she outlines how she feels that she has always been black. It isn't just, I choose to be black one day. It is something her lived experience is that in essence, she is. So why is that to be vilified universally without question and there's no discussion to be had here? And yet someone who chooses, uh, in other words, what, that gender identity is something that is malleable and open to options and actually infinite uh, options. Why? And I, I think well, there maybe is a he's vilified there. because he asked a question that's at the heart of the problem with identity well, politics, quite. period. It's I mean, particularly because when it comes to race, I mean, virtually all intersectionists would accept that race is socially constructed. This is something they're always talking about. And so therefore, in a sense, there is more of a case for transracialism. If, if you want to say that you can, you, that it is an identity that, that can be mixed. Well, in but, some sense, we already accept transracialism as a given. And so here's something I might as well get in trouble for this. <laughs> um, 
Well, if your ancestry is 95% Caucasian and 5% non-Caucasian, Asian, black, let's say, you're not Caucasian. Right. Generally we, speaking, you can identify with the minority group. And so at some point, the question becomes, well, it's a ridiculous question, which, which is why the whole notion of group identity construed in this way is so pathological. But we obviously accept some degree of transracial identification if your racial group is disproportionately in one category, but you identify with the other and that's instantly not only accepted, it's standard practice. Right. And I'm with the intersectionists on this insofar as race is, we're all the same. I, you know, ever since we've broken down the human genome, we know there are no differences between us. So th this idea uh, that it must be so rigidly policed, this, 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 this social construct, these, these arbitrary ideas. And yet Jen, I mean, I think it's, Something okay, so happened. now we know why. Now we know exactly why Dawkins got himself in so much well, trouble. Okay, and you know, he put his worse. finger. Well, it will, it will, for sure. It's for sure. But but the, magical but the, super Nazis are always in trouble. So you are exactly you know. exactly. But then what? But the, with the, with the question of uh, of the tr the gender identity debate. But th this is the debate we need to be having. Is that actually the other thing he put his finger on there? Is that actually people are arguing with different definitions in their heads? You know, for for. Uh, um, for the identitarians, the idea of a woman, it, a woman is an identity. It isn't a biological reality. Uh, but for most, for most people, the classification of woman is biological reality, not identity. So in other words, and, and why can I, why, why is it that we cannot have that discussion? So, okay. So you believe this thing and we believe the other. Uh, and that's why we're at loggerheads. Uh, uh, but, but let's, let's have the discussion. Why can that not happen? Why does it have to be? If you've decided well, that's that what we're that's actually what we're trying to unpack is what's the motivation at the root of this. And it seems to me, I do believe it's something like a pronounced infantilism. I mean, one of yeah. the things I've been toying with is the idea that the the gender the the demand for gender fluidity in late adolescence, let's say, is something like the consequence of insufficient fantasy play in childhood that that i remember for example when my son was little his sister and her friends used to dress him up as a fairy princess mm -hmm. they did this with some regularity and i kind of cast a dim eye on that but i thought it through and you know it sort of disturbed me and then i thought it through and i thought wait a second here leave the kid alone leave the girls alone he is playing out what it means to be female in dramatic play. And he needs to do that because otherwise he can't understand what it means to be female. That's how children understand. That's how adults understand things. For God's sake, we go to a movie and we watch someone play out a female and we identify with that because otherwise we wouldn't be enjoying the movie. And we get, uh, we get a bit of a clue about what it's like to inhabit someone else's skin. So, there's this necessity for play in gender roles and mm. that has to manifest itself. And if the play has been interrupted, let's say by electronic equipment, for example, or, or, or any of the other things that might be interrupting it, well, maybe that desire comes back with a vengeance later. And I, I have to be whoever I say I am. I have to be able to play with this. And well, if it's a developmental requirement, there's going to be a lot of insistence behind it. And it looks immature, and it is, because it should have happened earlier. Most people stabilize their gender identity by the time they're three or four. Um, but it doesn't always happen. So there is an infantilism in this demand for, for fluidity of identity, uh, this insistence that other people play the game that I insist they're going to play. And then um, what about the idea that the gender-critical feminists would come in and say, well, the idea of dress a boy dressing up in a dress there's nothing inherently female about that or feminine about that in any case that all of this is a, a construct anyway and why can't we let the kids just some kids are not gender conforming and they can just do what they want i mean the the the, the, the concern i have with the current identity obsessed ideology is that they see a boy in a dress and they will say well he could potentially be a woman and by doing so are reinforcing the most conservative views of, of gender uh, to begin with. Um, and that to me, see, well, that, that, 
I, I'm intuitively against that because I wasn't a gender conforming. I didn't play football with the other boys. You know, I didn't, I mean, I didn't dress up in dresses, but I may have done if they were lying around. You know, I, 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 I I've, I've, I find it very odd that this uh, supposedly progressive radical movement, uh, is so dependent on the idea of, of very, very traditional unyielding notions of what it is to be male and what it is to be female. Yeah. But and only I, in the case where the identity is across the the sex it that that it, so you can be if if you're a man who believes he's a woman that's inviolable and has a biological reference point but if you're a woman who thinks she's a woman it doesn't it's completely malleable and so well, then, you know that's an inherent contradiction again and that's that and it's worth and it's worthy of discussion surely and and the contradiction doesn't just go away because you won't allow the conversation to happen which no, is I the think, contradiction what, gets played out in in actuality, if right. you don't allow it to be dealt with in abstraction. So then the question is, how do we break through? And to, I mean, this is something I've been really, really thinking about is that it isn't no, it, it's, it's no longer just a matter of trying to persuade people. It's almost trying to de-radicalize people at this point. How do, how do I explain to someone the world isn't this fantasy world that you've created in your head where it's just, it's full of transphobes and neo-Nazis and all these and, and good versus evil. The world is actually much more complex and nuanced and requires discussion and thought. How do you break through someone's fantasy so that we can have that discussion? Well, it used because to be I, that you sent them to the u university so they could study the oh, well, humanities. That's well, the well, last that's thing really you should the, do now. Well, yeah. that was the answer. I mean, that was the whole point, right? To, to make people more sophisticated in their conceptions and, in which case, is it, is it the case that it's over now? If, if, if people were to be educated out of those problems and now that actually the, the, the higher education itself has become so ideologically driven that to go to university means you end up more indoctrinated than when you went there. What, what hope is there? I feel like I'm, I sound a bit frustrated here, but I feel like I'm bashing my head a bit against a brick wall because half, most of the time when I'm caught in an argument with, with these ide ideologues, they are arguing, like I say, with a monster they've created in their own heads. I'm not the person they think I am. I don't have the values they think I have. And and therefore, the, the discussion is stymied from the outset. And it does make me very frustrated. And that's probably the real reason I wrote the book, actually, <laughs> because I want, I want the idea of free speech to be elevated again as a sacrosanct principle so that we can have these conversations and so that people don't get demonized and attacked for things they don't believe. And, and, and so that we can reach some kind of consensus uh, on these issues that we've been describing, these contentious issues, because when you have an issue that's particularly tendentious, you it requires more conversation, it requires more discussion and more understanding. And I don't think we, we're getting that at the moment. Yeah, well, I guess I'm somewhat optimistic about that because I can see all the possibility that long form conversations of this sort bring. Well, there's an appetite for them, is, yes. isn't there? But, but, but is there an appetite for them? from the activists and the ideologues who have seen so much control in our major educational yes, I cultural think, I think institutions? So. I think so. I think so. Well, I mean, the, I've been struck by how how deep the hunger is for for genuine conversation and, and very much heartened by it. And so that's a I, counter movement. I hope say. you're right. I, I just don't see any evidence of that from the people I'm talking about. I don't see it from the people who will say well, to you, educate yourself. It's another yourself, problem too, you know? though, isn't it? With Twitter, it, for example, is right. that it's never the same people. And that, that plays with us psychologically because, of course, we are built to more or less assume that we're interacting with a continuous community. Yeah. And, and we aren't. We're, we're, we're interacting with a discontinuous community on Twitter. And so we're led astray in our presuppositions constantly. And, but it, I but mean, it's worse the, than that. It, it, it's like, it, because it isn't, I know it's, I know it's different people all the time, but they all have the same views on absolutely everything. It feels like you're arguing with the Borg. You know, it feels like just one, one mind speaking through many, many voices. Yes. Well, it is that then that's the hallmark of an ideology. It is precisely that. And, uh, and, and then I guess it's a matter of it certainly, and it's a matter of trying to understand the ideology ever more deeply to see what it's actually focused on. But I do, I, I do read their books and I do read their articles and I do try to, to understand. I don't believe the people I'm talking about return the favor. They, they always use the phrase, educate yourself. And what they mean by that is read these select books and digest them uncritically. That's what they mean by educate yourself. Uh, you know, they, they don't mean read widely and, and tackle the various views and come to a conclusion yourself. The last thing they want is critical thought. Critical thought is the enemy, uh, uh, you know, 
Ironically, it's the enemy of critical theory. It's, no, it's, it's a hallmark of white supremacy culture, as far right. as I can see. Right. That's right. what they say. But that's, that's what they become, claim. It's amazing, too, to see that uh, set of ideas propagate itself across the culture so quickly. The, the Canadian federal government, in its diversity, mm. inclusivity, and equity training program, now uses those concepts like associating white supremacy with punctuality, for example, they use those in the training of their civil servants. It's, it's been accepted wholeheartedly to that degree. In I've a, seen them. Uh, I've seen the screenshots that often get leaked of these training sessions and it bullet pointed, uh, hallmarks of white supremacy, punctuality, politeness, hard perfectionism. work. Perfectionism. Yeah. All these noble things. And, and I'm thinking, well, if I was a person of color, I would be f outraged by this. This idea that this is, this is a culture that's alien to me. This is, it's so offensive. Uh, and this is what, but it's so it absurd. Even, I mean, it's, it's so well, absurd it's, yeah. that you, you, you can hardly mount an argument against it. I mean, conscientiousness well, would, is, is a, <laughs> is a personality trait and there's no racial differences in conscientiousness. Right. It, and it, it wouldn't matter to me if it, if it was just a few idiots on Twitter or these extreme, it wouldn't matter to me, but, these people have disproportionate power, institutional power, political power. I mean, the Biden administration is, is on, on side with an awful lot of this kind of, of stuff. And, and the end point. Well, so is the Trudeau it, government. I mean, to well, have uh, this in the, in the training, uh, training documentation that's produced by the federal government is just absolutely stunning. It's also the document that I was referring to. I tweeted about it yesterday. It's so badly written that it's, 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 it's stunning. It's maddening with him. With, you know, and how is it he's got away with his history of blackface, for instance? How is it that the, there is no consistency there? Like, you know, it, it, it's, lack it's of effective opposition is a big part of it. It's insane. Canada. I mean, if you look at those old videos, it looks like he's spent more time in blackface than out of it. And yet he, he isn't the one who's being attacked and, and vilified for that. It's OK. He's got a free pass. It's weird to me. Yeah, well, the, the opposition in Canada, and this is a problem in general, is a real problem for our entire culture, is that mm. the woke narrative is very romantically attractive. It's got this rebelliousness about it and this impetus to go out and march in the streets and, you know, to work on a global cause. And like traditional conservatives and even traditional liberals can't mount a counter narrative. They, they don't the have the imagination and it's yeah, a the, huge the, problem. The trouble is, though, the cause that they're fighting for is large, largely illusory. And that, that to me is, is, is very frightening. We've had people in this country claim that our major universities, such as Oxford and Cambridge, are structurally institutionally racist. All of the data tells us this is just simply not the case. Oh, Racism yes. Well, that's just happening constantly in Canadian universities. The McGill Physics Department has now put out a diversity, inclusivity and equity statement. And, um, that that's predicated on exactly those views. Uh, well, I think we need to push back against the, the this particular uh, hi hyper racialization of society because it is reinscribing old racial tropes, even to the extent of fear of miscegenation. This old racist idea of of this fear of mixed couples. You know, there was an article in the Guardian here recently talking about how m finding mixed race people attractive is problematic. You know, this idea it's almost just taking old racist ideas and just let, giving them a kind of hint of respectability. And of course, the end point of that is segregation. You saw presumably the story at the, in, in California, the Brentwood school, the elite school that segregated its parents but, uh, on their, uh, their, what was it? A dialogue session with the teachers and you would have white parents in one and room you're and seeing black that parents in the convocation other ceremonies at universities too. How can this not, how can this be anything other than racist? Uh, you know, the, it's interesting that the, the the group FAIR, you know, the the, the group um, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, a lot of those those people who are doing great work, I think, are starting to call this neo-racism. There needs to be a label for it. Um, and I think maybe that's the right way to go about it because the word racism has almost become meaningless because the, the people who use it the most, they throw it around so liberally, you know, that, that it, I never believe it when I hear someone branded that way. I assume it's someone n not being honest and not being truthful. So what do we call this? What do you call it when people are advancing the cause of racial segregation in the name of anti-racism? What do you call that? I don't know what, that, I think, I think that's going to be the real struggle is not, it's not just breaking through the fantasy world. I don't like this idea of having to negotiate someone else's dreamland. There's that thing, firstly, but also there's the linguistic minefields. How do you convince people? The other reason, I mean, you mentioned the rebellious aspect of it. I think the other reason why it's so appealing is because the language sounds like you're doing good. Social justice, anti-racism. Who wouldn't be anti-racist? Uh, Black Lives Matter. Of course they do. Who would disagree with that? But, but, but these, that, these phrasing, 
can be used to push through some very pernicious ideas. And I mean, when it comes to anti-racism, for instance, I mean, Ibrahim X. Kendi makes it absolutely clear in his book that he feels to be not racist is simply another form of racism, that this, that this dichotomy doesn't exist. Well, what, and that's why I find it very hard when I'm having these arguments, because if I say I have a real problem with anti-racism, people will say, oh, I see. So you're for racism. And then you have to explain what anti-racism means when used by these academics in these very niche fields, such as whiteness studies. You have to explain first what that means, why that's dangerous for society and how in order to genuinely oppose racism, you have to oppose the discourse of anti-racism. I mean, when you say it like that, it's, it's, it's maddening, isn't it? It's, it's like it, 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 it's, it's, it's the stuff of nightmares <laughs> because there is no coherent sense and, and because so much of it is rooted in language and, and misdirection through language and, 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 and shielding what is actually meant, uh, it, it, it becomes impossible to win the argument. And, and maybe that's the point, you know, maybe, maybe this, I, they gave the word to us gaslighting, you know, when they, when they gaslight all the time and say the culture war is a right wing myth or cancel the people who are the, the chief practitioners of cancel culture saying that cancel culture doesn't exist. When they, when they say the opposite of what, what is the observable reality? I, I don't know how to, uh, break through that, how to, how to break through those arguments, because not only have they constructed a pseudo reality in their own minds, they've constructed the language with which to sustain that pseudo reality. So no one else can be drawn out of it. And that, that to me is going to be the challenge. Let me ask you, let's go sideways for a minute now. Mm -hmm. And, and I suppose this is an exploration of potential solutions as well. This has been a very serious conversation, but you're a satirist and a comedian as well. And so Isn't it you terrible have how un unfunny I am in real life. Isn't that awful? You know, it's, it, when I'm doing stand up, if I've got a script, I can be funny, but I can't be funny spontaneously. People are very disappointed about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm curious about your motivations. You okay. Let's talk about Titania McGrath. Why don't you define, describe her first for everyone? So Titania McGrath originated as a Twitter character um, in around April 2018. And the idea of the character is that she is a very um, privileged, po-faced, uh, young, white, intersectional activist who is determined to be offended by absolutely anything. She can problematize absolutely anything. You know, you could give her, you know, a, a pair of shoes or a hat or a, a, a holiday in Margate, and she would find a way to say that it is uh, irredeemably transphobic and white supremacist or something like that. She can do those things that the activists always do. So nothing is ever good enough for her. She's also immensely privileged. She comes from well, a well, independently wealthy background. She lives in, you know, one of those uh, sort of gated communities, which is 99% white. Um, but she, uh, she, she has a deep mistrust of the working class. Um, and, um, she, but she, she thinks that she is virtuous and noble and good. And she goes on Twitter, uh, and, uh, goes on the attack all the time, uh, trying to, uh, isolate things, trying to save the world in her, through, through, uh, in, intersectional theory. Um, and it's a very recognizable type of act. Even if you know nothing about intersectional, intersectionality or anything of the stuff that came out of the, the school of thought of Kimberly Crenshaw or any of those academics, even if you know nothing about that, you will recognize this type of figure because this figure is ubiquitous on Twitter, on social media. Uh, they always have their pronouns in their bio. Uh, they always use the same terminology such as hegemony or discourse or, or, or problematic or, or phallogocentric. If you want to go back to Derrida, you know, and, and she knows the right jargon to use, lived experience, cultural appropriation, mansplaining, toxic masculinity, all of those kind of things. And we know, and all of these things tend to be slogans in substitute of thought. You know, they, they're just things that get thrown out there. And and so what I wanted to do with the character is- Do you is know what slogan means? What you mean is uh, etymologically? No, I don't. Slua garam. It means battle cry of the dead. I love that. Oh I God! Think, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, man. I mean, if that well, doesn't well, send a chill up your back, you didn't understand it. Well, that's this is it. The, 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 I'm going to use that. That's great because that the, it is a kind of uh, a, it's almost like a, a battleground of zombies mm -hmm. who, who who don't have any capacity for independent thought anymore. I mean, you you try to get into a conversation with with, with someone like this, and I have the, many times. Yeah, well, sure, you <laughs> many, very people. publicly, <laughs> and the slogans that come back at you all the time. And, 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 and the lack of interrogation of those slogans, you know? But what I find so frustrating and so horrifying in some sense, I mean, I think a great canonical example of that is the interview that Helen Lewis did with me for the, for GQ, 
Mm. which is it's now more popular online than the channel four interview which i think the gq interview has like 32 million views or something preposterous but Mm. i never did talk to helen lewis i just talked to the ideology and it's not i don't like that i like to talk to the person and find out what they think but i heard you saying as well that before the interview uh she was very uh frosty and 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 and, oh and, yes, and almost, almost as though she had decided what you were in advance. Funnily, oh, enough. there was no almost. I yeah. <laughs> she definitely decided what I was before the before the discussion. Yeah, yes, ex- that, that, exactly. And, and she's been beating the same drum more recently as well, which has driven many people to the interview because she yes. published an article in the Atlantic Monthly and in another locale as well. Um, so when when you're faced with those, I mean, it's it's I, I just see it all the time, so often. And uh, to give a, another recent. I- example that we had the um obviously since the harry and megan interview with oprah winfrey uh and there was a controversy over here because piers morgan who hosts a, a show called good morning britain got into an argument with a- another colleague on the show a man called alex beresford i think and um it was really interesting watching once the- they'd had the argument they sat down they tried to talk through the issues and piers morgan pointed out that some of the things that megan had said in the interview were factually wrong and had been proven to be factually wrong. His response was, Alex Berifan's response was, but that's her lived experience. And then he said, yes, but we have the evidence here that it is factually incorrect. And again, he said, but it's her lived experience. So mm-hmm. in other words... See, that's that insistence that, that the fantasy world, the subjective world trumps everything. Right. So, so and, and that once you've... It's almost like these, these phrases... If you use the right, if you use the phrase lived experience or toxic masculinity, whatever, you're in the club, what you've signaled that you're, you're, you're right. You know, and I know that academics have always done this, you know, the jargon, you're, you're in the group, you're in the in group if you've got the right, if you know how to deploy the right words. But there's something more sinister about this because it is morally right in these situations. That's the sinister thing is that. Mm-hmm. It's 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 mo- it's morally incontrovertible. You've made the statement, and and that's it. And there's no further discussion. Yes, well, you're actually, not evil. That's what you're saying. Right. I'm not so, evil. So I th- so with so the reason with Titania, I wanted her to be obsessed with this language, and so and 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 why I read so much of this stuff so that I knew the the way that they speak is because I thought the best way to expose the the inherent contradictions of 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 that position and the thoughtlessness. Moreover, the thoughtlessness of that position is 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 to to embody it in a character. Right. So, so, so you were playing. You were playing a dramatic game, essentially, and, which is a form in, of thought. In doing so, I've actually uh, c- come to understand the people I'm satirizing a whole lot more. And look, let's face it. Every now and then, they'll hit on a point that is actually right. And and you know, even when I read White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, which I think is a terrible book and is 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 so flawed throughout. Every now and then, she'll hit on something, and you think for a moment, oh. There's something in that. And then she'll undercut it by saying, well, everyone's a racist and all the rest of it, you know, and, and it just goes back to being absurd. But, um, and, and that book in of itself is a very good example of this, you know, setting up a reality that cannot be penetrated because she will say that any kind of uh, critical questioning of her position is evidence of the very pervasiveness of white supremacy that she's identified. So you can't win because even engaging in a discussion is proof of, of your malevolence, according to her theory. It's absolutely hopeless. Um but I thought, I thought, I thought, because the movement is so riven with contradiction, actually, the more effective way of tackling it isn't through dialogue. Firstly, because the people I'm talking about seem are impervious to reason; uh, they mistrust dialogue. They see debate as a form of violence. So you're never going to get mm-hmm. through to them that way. Yeah, and that—that's actually what, an explicit part of the theory. It really is. So then, in creating a satirical character, right? That it's refle- not that they're anti-free speech. There's no such thing as free speech in that theoretical framework. No, it it's a misapprehension well, all the way down to the bottom. Which is why I, I get so frustrated. I've often been in debates where I've tried to invite these very people to participate in the debate, to hear them out. And they would say that to even appear would be to dignify the position. So it's it's an absolute I- I- a nightmare. Um, and it also protects themselves from, from potential criticism, which is, of course, the, the whole point. But I, but I thought by creating a satirical character that embodies those contradictions, that thoughtlessness... It might reflect back onto them that the, ha, I suppose, how they look to normal people, because I don't think they appreciate. I think they're so caught up within their own little bubbles, within their own, own little groups. They they never hear an alternative point of view. I mean, I I used to work with academics like this who were so within their little groups, and they're they're constantly quoting each other and supporting each other and giving the illusion that their views have, uh, cannot be disputed. Uh, but if you're 
But what if you, you're suddenly confronted with how other people perceive you? And will that give you pause for thought? Okay, so every- you, when you started T- Titania, you didn't announce that she was a satirical character. You started no. playing on Twitter. Tell me, tell me the story. Exa- what exactly what happened? Because she, that Twitter account became extraordinarily well known and very rapidly. So I'm curious about what, how you did that, and how you responded once it started to, you know, amass some cultural um, significance. I was very surprised that it took on. Um, it became so popular so quickly and i'd started it uh because i'm more to entertain myself more than anything i was so frustrated with this and i wanted to try and expose the absurdity of it. i mean my, my background is as a stand-up comic and as a stand-up comic i'm not necessarily satirical i will stand there on a stage and ridicule the thing that i perceive to be a, a problem with society with satire what you're doing is you're often embodying it with a kind of ironic detachment or you are uh you, you know you're addressing it you're always going after what you perceive to be the vices and follies of society. And I thought that was a good way of doing it. And right, also so there you had to other- stay on a kind of edge. You had to be believable enough as the character right. so that you could pass, but you had to push it just past the point of, of, of what? Of, of rationality or believability? And, yeah, it's a funny it, edge. I, I was continually getting into arguments with people and staying in character. I've always stayed in character, uh, even to today. And I've actually... If you go to the Titania account now, my pinned thread is a thread of conversations that I've had with people in character who are angry about the things I've tweeted. And these can go on for pages and pages. And it's fascinating to me because um, it's close enough to the truth. She says really ridiculous things, really absurd things like um, like s- speaking or writing in English is an act of colonial violence. She'll say that, you know, uh, the only way to guard against uh, fascism is if the state are allowed to arrest people for what they say and think, you know, stuff like this, which is so obviously absurd. And yet it's close enough to what people actually say um, that people believe it and get annoyed about it. And what I've always liked to do is to stay in character and have those conversations with these people. Um, and, um, and then I posted the screenshots of the conversation. So, but part of the point of that is not to humiliate the people who had fallen for it, because actually the point I'm making is I understand why they would fall for it because it's so close to what people actually say. Um, and, and, and by doing that, my hope is, I suppose that it's, it exposes uh, the folly of this stuff. Sometimes even when I'm in those arguments, I will say something that is so out of the, out of, you know, just completely out of the realm of possibility. So stupid. Um, And yet they still don't, things have become so absurd that they don't twig. I mean, even today, there was a story today in the UK, uh, a, a museum, a Jane Austen museum is now going to interrogate Jane Austen's use of sugar in her tea because it has connections to plantations and white supremacy and slavery. Uh, you know, something like that, which is just so absurd. Or the the recent controversy over Bluey, the Australian cartoon dog, because it doesn't have enough dogs of colour and, and gender diverse dogs in the cartoon. Now, that sounds like something I would make up as a joke, um, but it's real. It's It's actually happening and people are taking it seriously. And so therefore, in a sense, it's become harder with Titania because anything that I come up with uh, is going to be topped by by real life very, very quickly. Um, so what it just have you means- learned about the people that Titania annoys? So she's a hyper-politically correct avatar, and mm-hmm. but she tangles up people who are opposed to that sort of thing. And so that yeah. must have also shed substantial light for you on people on the other side of the... It does. Uh, and, uh, and so what have you learned? Well, one of the things is that the people on the other side who might even be quite, um, might even be of my opinion about these things. Uh, a, a lot of people are very quick to anger, uh, and, and verbal abuse as a, as a go to, as an instant response. Um, so a, a lot of the people who get angry with her really go after her looks. And, and I mean, she's not real. Um, a friend of mine, Lisa created the image of the woman. She's a composite of four different women. So it, it's not a parody. See, this is the thing. It's not a parody of any particular person. It's a, it's a type of, of person. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the people who get angry with her and the people who are genuinely angry about the social justice movement are absolutely furious about the way it is impinging on every aspect of their lives. They are sick of it. So when they see someone as extreme as Titania, they really let rip. And I don't think that's healthy. You know, I, it's not in my nature to go and abuse someone online or, or to get angry online. I, it's, I, I, but I've seen the extent that what it, what it shows, I suppose, is that that kind of, uh, 
uh, instinct to immediately go for the abusive or the vicious or the attack or the ad hominem is present across the political spectrum. It's, 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 it's everywhere. Or maybe that's just a sign of Twitter. Maybe that's just a, a symptom of, of, of social media. Um, and I've learned a lot about how social media works. I think that's, that's another thing about it is that I've really, uh, for one thing, the, the fact that she's, she's been banned a number of times and I've learned how to avoid the bans and uh, about, about the way that, big tech censors and how they censor and, and why and what if, and, what has she been banned for so uh the tweets that she was banned for a couple of times she's had a, a, a number of one day suspensions a number of seven day suspensions once or twice it's been inexplicable to me why why she would be banned it seems a, a bit like someone at silicon valley has twigged that their precious ideology is being mocked and they don't like it that that's the only explanation i could think of however on a couple of instances it's when she's a uh, I suppose what they would say incited violence. Um, and of course she hasn't done anything of the kind. There was one tweet where she said she was going to go to a, uh, a UKIP rally. UKIP is a right-wing nationalist political party in the UK. And she said, I'm going to go to this UKIP rally uh, to punch people in the name of compassion or love or something like that, you know, which is the idea that a lot of these activists have that actually, whereas words are violence and awful, actual physical violence can be defended uh, you know, in their, in their view. It's so perverse. And of course I was making a comment about, the perversity of that idea that, that, that you think microaggressions are, are actual violence, but you're perfectly content uh, to go out and set fire to cars and beat people up if they have the wrong opinion or pepper spray people in the face if they voted for Trump. You know, there's an obvious, there's an obvious contradiction there that I was trying to expose. So she had a ban there. I think that might have even been the one where she was permanently banned. I had a, an email from Twitter saying, this is a permanent ban. You're not getting back on. And then there was a bit of an outcry. From from a, from people who follow her, some prominent people who follow her, and Twitter rescinded that changed their minds and and brought her back. And as a result of that, inevitably, her follower count leapt because, of course, when you try and censor something, you draw attention to it. But you're you're always treading a fine line. I mean, my friend Lisa, who I mentioned, Lisa Graves, used to have a Twitter account called Jarvis Dupont, who is one of my favourite accounts on on Twitter, and he was um, banned completely permanently banned. They actually went on a bit of a purge of satire accounts. There was one afternoon where Twitter purged 12 or 13 satirical accounts and deleted them. Uh, Titania came back for some reason. I think it's because she, she was the bigger account, but a lot of them just got ditched. And that I think shows that, you know, the, the, the powers that be at Silicon Valley, they don't like to be mocked. They don't, well, no one in authority likes to be mocked. It's the best way to undermine authority, isn't it? And it's, it's why every despot in history has killed the clown. Well, you know, that's why we have to be so careful when any of our laws start making comedians nervous. They're the ultimate I mean, canary in the coal mine. And I'm even more so than artists, I think. The artists are next, probably, but. Absolutely. I mean, you, you'll know in Canada, Mike Ward was fined, I think, $42,000 uh, by the Quebec Human Rights Commission for a joke that he told. If you, and by the way, if you. You know, this yes, is not and Montreal, some... of course, has one of the world's great comedy festivals. And and some of that humor, I've, I've been to the comedy festival a couple of times. And at midnight, you can go and hear particularly outrageous com right. comedy, which I actually think it was in one of those where he said what he got fined for. And, and I, you know, I don't even know the context because because he said it in French, for one thing. So I, don't, I didn't fully understand. But I read the transcript and I spoke to him about it. And what was interesting is that he's not some you know, open mic act who's, who, who doesn't, hasn't been on the, he's an established, famous, successful uh, comedian who was, uh, who was fined for a joke that if you actually break it down and analyze it, there's nothing remotely offensive uh, about it. You know, I mean, it's perfectly, po there, I don't think comedy can, can exist without the potential to cause offense. And yeah, what worries no. me. Neither can truth. Right. Quite. And comedy so is almost always truth. Almost always. That comedian says something funny and it's true in a way that people didn't expect and they know it. And, and. It, well, it's it, also that, it's also that thing of, 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 uh, of teasing the boundaries of tolerance of, 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 of almost, almost having that kind of cathartic effect, the way that the, the ancient Greeks would watch a tragedy and, and, and hear about the dismemberment and all sorts of vile things to, to philosophically to purge themselves of the, of, of, of that evil that lay within. Uh, in a sense, when you hear a comedian say something utterly outrageous, uh, it, it can have that effect on you and you laugh in spite of yourself. And then you laugh again because you are saying to yourself, why did I laugh at that? That makes me, I shouldn't have done that. So you're almost laughing at your own response as well. It has a double effect. And we are really losing that. I mean, I don't know how it is in Canada, but, but, but in the UK, 
a lot of this kind of mistrust of comedy and mistrust of jokes and the idea that certain jokes normalize hatred is coming from the comedians themselves. And a lot of comedians uh, take it on themselves to police other comedians' material and, and they get very angry when people broach certain subjects. I've, I consider it very, very unhealthy. Um, and not all comedians, by the way, I'm not saying that all comedians, I'm just saying certainly the more establishment comedians absolutely uh, would fall into this category. And it's it's really shocked me. This has been... Since I started Tanya in particular, a lot of comedians have been very angry that I mocked the social justice movement or, or you know, that I, you know, which to me is absurd because, you know, I spent years, three years writing, co-writing the Jonathan Pye uh, character. And because that predominantly mocked Trump and the right and conservatives and, and you know, it went, those were the targets. That was OK. So I never got uh, this kind of venom about about that. But as soon as I was mocking social justice ideology, which I perceive to be an extremely powerful ideology. You know, this isn't, I don't think I'm punching down. I think I'm punching up at these, at these, at these people who have captured these institutions and, and, and are ruthless, by the way, absolutely ruthless and bullying. I think the social justice movement utterly legitimizes bullying. And I don't like bullies and I like to stand up to bullies. And that, Titania is my attempt to stand up against the bullies. But what they will do is misrepresent my intentions and will say, oh no, you just want to have a go at gay people or whatever, or have a go at minority groups. And, and I, I've been very shocked by that because that, that kind of response has even come from comedians. And my view is that if you've got half a brain, you know, that's not what I'm doing. You, I mean, you, you absolutely have to know that that's what, not what I'm doing. And yet, well, maybe they do know. Maybe they, maybe this is a willful misinterpretation as a means to attack me because I've, because I've mocked the ideology I'm not meant to mock. But I tell you what, whenever there's, whenever there are consequences for mocking someone, then I think that's the person you ought to be mocking, right? I, I think that's a sign. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you, uh, are, would you, <laughs> what effect has pr producing Titania had on your life? And, and if you could mm. go back and decide whether you were going to do it again, would you? I mean, it must be shocking. Yeah. I would I, think it's shocking to have have seen what happened, to be at the center of what happened when you created that character. But I'd like to know. I, well, for one thing, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't expect the reaction that I got. Also, you've got to remember that for a long time, the character, I was anonymous um, b because I, I, part of the effect of the character was that people thought she was real. That was so sort of integral to it. And then I was outed by a newspaper over here the week that her first book came out. Um, and that, although that was very good for the book because it generated a lot of publicity, because then the story became that I was the person behind the, the character. Um, in effect, it had an enervating impact on the, on the, on the character because now what happens, people know it's me behind the character. People. However, what I will say is even to this day, there's always some people who fall for it. Whenever I tweet something, there's always some people who fall for it. So it has that. So, so there's that. But then there's the impact on my personal life. Well, I would do it again because I feel very passionately uh, that the, 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 the movement that I'm mocking, the ideology that I'm mocking is a dangerous one. And I, I, I feel very passionately that it is uh, 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 divisive and damaging to society, as damaging as any ideology can be. I think it, it has the potential to go to those lengths. Um, and And so that I think... I would almost be in dereliction if I, if I didn't mock it, it would be, it would be, I'll tell you what it would be. It would, it would be an act of self-censorship if I didn't go after these targets. And that's by the way, how most comedians, I mean, a lot of comedians think this stuff is ridiculous. They won't go near it because they know that if they do, they won't get on the BBC and they won't get booked by certain clubs. So they just leave it well alone. But I think I, I, I couldn't do, I could, I, I just, that's not in my nature. So I, I, so I, I don't regret that. The, the fact that so many, friends of mine, former friends on the company circuit, no longer talk to me. That's something which I suppose I could say is unfortunate. On the other hand... How many times has that happened to you? How many friends do you think you've lost? It's in double figures. It's certainly in double figures. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, and it's not just Tanya. It's also partly, I suppose, my politics. It's also... Um, it, it, it's, it's effectively being honest about what I think. Uh, and saying opinions that might not be the establishment or, or fashionable opinions. And it, it gets people very angry. I mean, one particular incident I can think of is when I met for a drink with two friends, very old friends of mine, a married couple. And uh, he started screaming at me in the pub. Call, I, I won't swear on your podcast, but calling me an effing Nazi. And then another word, which I probably shouldn't say at this point. Um, but, but, and, and, and I thought he was joking at first. And, and we had this conversation and I, and it was true. He'd, 
he'd completely bought into this fantasy of who I was. And, and there was no going back from that. Um, and I know it was fueled by alcohol, but no apology was forthcoming or no, no it, it, you know, it's, and then every now and then there'll be, I mean, it happened to be a couple of months ago where a comedian I've known for many, many years from the circuit suddenly sent me this abusive message online on Twitter and started attacking me and saying I was, what he said I was funded by dark foreign powers or, or something utterly absurd, you know, and, um, and I thought, well, okay, so this is now my reputation. Of course, reputation. that is what you'd say if you were funded by dark foreign powers. Well, this is this is the problem. Like I, I said, you know, I've said it before. Like if, if uh, you know, if I am getting all this dark money, it must be very dark because I haven't seen any of it. It's not, it, I, you know, that'd be great, fine, but I'm not. And this idea that I'm this sort of, it's that going right back to what you said at the start, like th that I'm defending free speech because I, 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 because I'm an evil person who wants to say evil things, and so there's all of that, all that I'm mocking. I'm mocking minority groups through Titania, which is absolutely not what I'm doing. It's the opposite. I'm, I'm mocking those very affluent and powerful people who uh, very patronizingly assume that they, they, they know what's best for minorities. You know, it's the opposite of what people say it is. Um, but these kind of experiences, uh, on the one hand, I think it's a bit sad, isn't it? Because there are people now I've had to go through my phone and delete lots of numbers because I know we'll never talk again. But on the other hand, were they my friends to begin with? I'm not so sure. You know, if, if they can, if they can suddenly become so bigoted, and that is the word. They, well, they are it's completely... an indication of how profound the divide has started to become in our culture, right? That, I mean, 20 yeah. years ago, I never lost any friends because of my hypothetical political opinions, but and, and what, things would you have say changed. That you must have lost, your, your case must be much more severe than mine, it, 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 you know, because you're so much more famous and so much more known. Has, have lots of friends turned on you? Uh, no, actually, oh. not not a lot. Uh, some there's some outstanding exceptions. Although even in those situations, I would say there was extenuating circumstances. No, I've been I've been really fortunate in that regard. That my the my close circle of of intimates, my family and and my my close friends, have been staggeringly loyal to me under which is wonderful severe that's distress. Wonderful. Yes, that's wonderful. I so is it maybe the case, does that tell us that actually what it's really about is the fact that I was working in an industry, which is, you know, the, so, uh, the comedy industry is so on board with the woke ideology to such an extent that in fact, so many of its, its uh, uh, so many comedians are now really just uh, avatars for that, for that ideology, maybe. Maybe. I mean, my professional colleagues certainly haven't leapt to my defense. Well, that's, um, that's what I was going to ask, actually. I yes. mean, surely... You know, no, that's sure. been, no, that's pretty much done with. I mean, I, okay. I would say my name, I've decided this recently because of the slurs that have been associated with me. I can't in good conscience accept graduate students anymore because right. if they go out, you know, you talked at the beginning about this register where that's been set up in Britain, um, where if you are charged, accused of a non-crime hate act, yeah. It's recorded without a trial. I mean, I've been on hiring committees many, many times. And especially in academia, there's an oversupply of highly qualified people, of radical oversupply. And so if there's anything in your record at all that's the least yes. bit uh, contentious, it's like you're you're done. And of so course. being my student, that's not a little bit contentious. That's really, really contentious. And so it's now become impossible for me to to uh, to serve my proper right. function as a as a scientist and as a university professor. So that's it's taking a lot of adjustment on my part to get accustomed to that. And I don't practice clinically anymore as well. And there are a variety of reasons for that, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly the I've become very, very susceptible to attacks through the college of psychologists, um, the governing board, they can make the life of a practitioner brutally miserable with a single letter. And, mm. um, that's very, very punishing. And it's also perhaps not necessarily good for my potential clients to be associated with someone who's controversial. They already have enough trouble. So although I've been fortunate on the family and friends front, the, on the professional front, things have, have been, you know, more dismal. Isn't that just 
suggestive of the of the the, the power of this movement and and the effectiveness of, the effectiveness of cancel culture. In fact, the way the ease with which people can become stigmatized. You know, all it takes is a few accusations of your far right or alt right or whatever, and it's there. You know, any prospective employer can Google that, and it comes up. And who's going to take the risk? You know, the accusation is sufficient to damn you, and and that's that's what. The well, there that you put the finger on the on the absolute catastrophe of the non crime hate index. It's like, yeah. well, it's it's a permanent stain, especially in a in a technological universe where nothing is ever forgotten, no matter yeah. how long the lag. And it's worse because the government here feels no compunction to address this or or to it's no politician to seem to has. Well, I suppose they are well because the strategy is that if you oppose hate speech laws you're obviously a hateful person why else would you oppose hate speech law? you know it's the old thing and and a, and a politician doesn't want to stand up in parliament and be the one who is seen to be siding with the the evil guys the bad guys well, you have to make a very very subtle argument to stand up against hate speech laws because you're faced with the problem that there is such a thing as hate speech yeah obviously I mean, is, so well, when it's is, pernicious and terrible it's like okay so you're arguing uphill this is again why it's such a bloody miracle that we ever had free speech to begin with it's almost inconceivable to me that we managed to generate the baseline presumption of innocence that's mm. a miracle the the fact that you can go bankrupt and start again that's a miracle the idea that you ever had free speech and that 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 was genuinely the case that's a miracle and none of this is is given the appropriate respect and awe that it deserves because it's so unlikely it's hugely unlikely. I mean, I know in the book, I, I talk about, give a kind of very, very short history of free speech from the ancient Greeks to today. And it, and it, the, the point of that is to, to accentuate this point that actually the fact that we have it is astonishing and unlikely, so unlikely. And, and all the more reason why we need to defend it. We need to be really, really vigilant about any cracks that appear in this, in this, because it, it, it will go away very, very easily, you know, if we don't defend it. And it's hard, particularly when it comes to the idea of, that's why I wrote a chapter on hate speech because, and 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 took the uh, the other side's view seriously, because just trashing the opposing argument isn't going to help. We have to talk about it and explain, you know, why it's important. Nevertheless, well, for one thing, like you say, hateful speech exists. Let's start from that point. Let's acknowledge that that hateful speech exists and it can be hurtful and it can do damage. But then the alternative is a state that might in the future be completely unscrupulous uh, that is going to decide for you what what you can say and those are the things that we have to tackle and no but and the other key thing is that no one knows how to define hate speech you know UNESCO the European Court of Human Rights they they they've all agreed there's no way to define hate speech every european country that has hate speech laws has different hate speech laws different definitions subjective abstract concepts such as hate such as offence such as a uh, perception you know, and these are on the statute books and you don't want this stuff on the statute books because it's all very well. I mean, I know the we talked about the SNP and their hate crime bill. The defense I'm always running into is people are saying, yes, OK, technically someone could be arrested and imprisoned for saying some an offensive joke. Technically, yes. But no one in their right mind, no jury, no judge uh, is going to. They, we've got common sense. It's OK. Well, that's so myopic. I mean, what, because you don't know who's going to be in charge in 10 years time. You don't know who that judge is going to be. You, how can you possibly just... You can be certain it, that someone will be in charge that doesn't approve of you and that you don't approve of. That will in, right. in, that will in, certainly happen. You don't want vague, vague wording on the statute books. It's going to be exploited at some point, even though, even if it's not today. There's absolutely no way that you can guarantee it against future against the future abuses of that and i don't it is as you say it's a certainty so i i'm i'm yeah i think it's i think it's actually one of the most important arguments that we should make uh and that and that we need to do you know free speech needs to be defended in every successive generation it's not something that you you, you know you know this you you get it and then it's there forever no that's not true but there's something about human nature there's something about people in power there's something about the way that we are uh that uh, it will collapse. It's it's an edifice that is not secure at, at any given time. And but it's hard. It's that thing of of being smeared. The risk is you're going to be smeared. You're going to be associated with the worst possible kinds of people because, of course, 
it's only really controversial speech that ever requires protection. Uh, and people are going to say, well, then you must support what, what these awful people are saying. And it's, it's hard to make the case, but it's a case that nonetheless has to be made. And particularly by politicians, I've been incredibly disappointed, uh, by the way in which, uh, politicians in this country have not made any kind of effort to, to, if anything, as from what I can see, uh, there are moves even in the, in the English Parliament to push through further hate speech laws. We should be repealing them, not pushing for them. But, but no one wants to have the argument. No one wants to be tainted. Yeah, well, they get identified one by one and taken out. That's what happens. Well, you get put on a list. This is it. The, 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 the identitarian left, if that's what we're going to call them. I don't know what to call them. That's the problem. Is They're very clever about evading even a, a label. Um, but they like making their lists. They like observing and saying, you know, you, 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 are, you are problematic. Uh, you, you have sinned. And, and, and now they have a, an electronic trail. They, 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 these are the people that absolutely love going through all of your old tweets and messages and anything they can find. Uh, and, and of course, the point about that is you can do that to anyone. There is no one alive who, if you had complete unfettered access to everything they've ever written online or in their emails or text messages, that you couldn't construct a case to damn someone. If that's you really actually one of to. the things that's more or less saved me. Is, is that, that right? Well, by the time I, made my political statement, which was a philosophical statement or even a spiritual statement, not a political statement. Mm. I already had 200 hours of lectures online. And so yes. essentially everything I'd ever said to students was recorded. And there wasn't, it wasn't possible to pull out a smoking pistol. So this was very smart. And also, I mean, but this is why it's also astonishing. It, I, I find it unendingly astonishing the way you are mischaracterized because, because it's all there. Everything you think is out in the open. You've been very, very, very clear and explicit about your point of view. And so wh when they try and demonize you and turn you into this thing, people can check and they'll realize that you're, that, I think what they're doing is they're relying on the reputational damage being a kind of barrier to people even investigating who you really are. Yeah. Well, in, to some degree that, that works, but it, it doesn't really work because what hmm. genuine generally happens is that, you know, for every person who wouldn't open a lecture because of my reputation there's three or four who do because they're curious and and then it has an even more perverse effect on in some cases on the true believers because they're primed to find anything i said offensive but that doesn't happen or maybe mm. they even find it useful and then that's not good at all it's like well he's isn't demonized. that interesting when you meet the people when you get into conversation with people and you and you can see that you're not what they thought you were and they don't know quite what to do with that you know and that that to me is that to me is why another reason why we need more speech not less we need to have the conversation so that people can be disabused of the the fantasies that they've been wallowing in you know but i do very much enjoy that when when uh, people expect one thing and then they actually actually speak to me and and they 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 don't see that that there's there's no evidence of it because it doesn't exist yeah, well, it's interesting to watch that unfold in the public domain, too. I mentioned those two interviews, the Channel 4 interview that has mm. been viral and, and the interview by, by Helen Lewis at GQ. And those, those interviews basically consists of, consist of nothing but the attempt by the interlocutor to have a conversation with the person that exists in their imagination. Right, but what's there is almost that? no relationship to me at all. <laughs> that was particularly the case with with uh, Kathy Newman, and yeah, uh, and it was what, less so with Helen Lewis. But it was still that was still essentially the issue. It's quite reassuring, though, isn't it? That that once it's out there, people can see through it. You know, in, it's in very words, reassuring. Is and what's what saved me, and this has given me an endless supply of hope. I would say is that hmm. all I've ever had to do is be. It's just show everything. It's like, here's the situation. No edits. Like, this is what yeah. happened. And every time so far, <clears throat> so far, you know, I haven't been fatally damaged. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things, one of the, the things I've learned most, I think, since, since uh, Titania kicked off and, and it became a known thing is I've learned simply never to trust uh, the perception of someone as, as, as constructed in the media or online or, you know, I, I, I it's a not, it's never the same person. I've, I've, I've ended up meeting, you see, coming from the background I did, most of my friends were always on the left. I didn't really know uh, conservative people. And now I have a lot of friends who are conservatives, you know, and they're just not, 
this villain that they were made out to be. And even some famous conservatives who people have said they're absolute monsters, they're evil, they want to eat babies, basically, or the equivalent, you know, and, and you, you get to know them and you realize, oh my goodness, the, 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 the perception is so removed from the, so far removed from the reality that even I, once had had bought into it myself because everyone's telling mm-hmm. you this. Oh yeah, the same um, thing. Is, is, so I've I, certainly I, had that experience repeatedly, repeatedly. I never trust it now. I, I like whenever I hear uh, the way people talk about people online. I just I I never trust it unless I know someone personally. I'm never going to trust that again. I, I think that's an it's an important lesson for me. So what's next for you? And also how. How do you make a living? You can't make a living as Titania <laughs> McGrath. Well, may, I mean, you're locked down still, so it's got to be hard being a comedian. Right. So, I mean, well, comedy came to an end. I mean, the last, I did a tour, I did a stand up comedy tour in 2019, early 2019. And that was really uh, the last big thing I did because as soon as I was about to do some more live performances, the lockdown the lockdown came and and it's the same you know i'm not complaining because absolutely every live performer has has the identical experience and we've all we've all you know i'm not in a position to complain uh and what yeah it's a very good question i like it because it's also very direct how do i make my money well i um i write articles for various publications i um there's the, the the titania books uh have have kept me going um I obviously used to work on the Jonathan Pye character. We, we had a couple of television shows and live tours. Those those were particularly lucrative. And for a long time, I did just make my money as a stand-up comic. So literally, just the money I would make from um, from from the circuit. Uh, now I've I've just got a job with. Well, it's it's you know I gave up being a full time teacher for this, and I uh, was on a regular wage. It was a good it was a good salary, and uh, I left it. <laughs> at great risk, you know, because I don't come from a wealthy family. I don't have in- the means to support myself without this kind of stuff. So I, uh, I went, well, I actually went part time first and was on the stand up circuit. And then I started earning enough from stand up to, to get by. And so I went full time stand up. Uh, but I, w- I was really, I was genuinely struggling financially for a long time. And then, um, then Jonathan Pye happened, which was very successful. Uh, particularly because we had a big viral hit around the time of the Donald Trump election, which actually went viral in America as well. And that really helped broaden the character. And then we did live tours and all the rest of it. I mean, we played the London Palladium and the Hammersmith Apollo. And so it was a big thing for me. And then Titania happened and the book did very well. And the second book did well. And How and, many um, copies do you, and you don't have to tell me, obviously, but how many I don't many know. Co- actually, the truth is I don't know. I, 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 that's something I should ask at some point. It's the sort of thing I don't look into. Uh, you know, it's, I, 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 I got a royalty check the other day and I thought that's, I thought it was done. And actually this was quite a lot of money. I thought, well, okay, that, so it, that's good. This is something that I can keep me going. But I've also just got a new job, um, as a, a broadcaster on a new channel called GB News in the UK. Uh, and that will be, uh, a pretty full time, full on, uh, presenter job. Um, so I will be, able, I will, but what's good about that job is, uh, you know, I think we have a real problem in the, with the news media in this country is that we don't have enough diversity of thought and, and, and the, the conversations that we ought to be having. This gives me an opportunity to do that. So it's very much related to the work I've been doing. But in addition, I'm going to continue with my comedy work and Titania. Uh, we're doing a, 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 some live shows with Titania played by an actress. We did that just before the lockdown. We had to postpone the tour. Now we're going to do another one. Um, so I will, yeah, it's, it, a lot of people get very scared by um, making a living as a creative person because you're as, always on the line. As they should be. Jesus, well, it's a tough way to make a living, man. It really, I mean, you're taking a massive risk and most creatives I know are very, very poor. You know, it's, it's simply not, and most have other jobs, you know? Yeah, there's a tiny and, fraction that are hyper rich and everyone oh, else starves. Virtually no one. And I consider myself extremely fortunate to be able to do this full time, the stuff I love full time, because for most of my adult career, I couldn't. And I was, you know, I, I had to have a full-time job and as well as go out in the evenings uh, and, and do all of this stuff. And and so it's a real, uh, you have to really commit and and you also have to be aware in the back of your mind of the likelihood of failure. That's, the, you know, that's the other thing that you have to be fully aware of. Um, and I'm, I'm by no means take it for granted. You know, I, I think I'm, uh, yeah, it, it's, the, the stuff I've done, comedy and Titania and the, the book I've just written, none of this stuff would make me rich. It would, it would, it would keep me going. 
uh, the new job I've got is going to be a, a more regular income, which is something I miss. I haven't had this since I was a teacher. I miss that. You know, there was, I, I miss routine and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, well, but that's I think another it, complicating I, factor is not only if you're trying to exist creatively, not only is it a very high risk proposition financially, yeah. but you lack that psychological uh, comfort that comes from routine, which, you know, people, artistic people often are hy hypercritical of routine, but God alive, man, routine oh, keeps you sane and trying to invent you. yourself every day. That's, that's not for the faint hearted. I've seen very few people manage that successfully across decades. No, absolutely. And I, I, I think particular, you know, particularly in comedy, you know, you, because you have to work for about three or four years on the circuit without getting paid anything. In fact, you're losing money because you're paying for your travel expenses and then you get somewhere and you don't get, you don't get paid for it. And, and it's, this is why a lot, you'll find a lot of comedians, particularly in the UK are from, are from quite wealthy backgrounds or privately educated because they, you know, they have rich parents who can help them out, put them up in a flat and they don't have to work during the day and, and they escalate much quicker through the ranks. But, uh, it, but if you come from my sort of background, you can't do that. You have to have the job and then, and, and you have to, it's like having two jobs. Uh, and so you have to really care about it. I mean, my, my advice is always that I do believe, although it comes with that insecurity, if it is a vocation for you, you have to do, I mean, for me, I couldn't have done anything. It's, it is a genuine vocation for me. Even if I were making no money whatsoever out of comedy or writing or the rest, I would still be doing it because I would feel unfulfilled if I were not doing it. I think there's something also quite, I mean, I take your point about the practicalities of living and the business of living, but my God, I think uh, depriving yourself of your vocation can be so soul destroying. I think. No, it is. Well, for, for I've, I've spent a lot of time studying creativity scientifically. And mm. um, the first thing that's useful to note is that creativity is not common. I mean, mm. everyone isn't creative. That's wrong. Yeah. Some people are very creative. A minority of people are very creative. And I mean, it's it's a continuum, but you don't get, you know, you don't get creativity till you get out to the point where what you're doing is original. And that's very yeah. difficult. So it's a minority proposition. And then of those original people, there's only a tiny fraction that can make a successful financial go of it because it's just you have to be creative, plus you have to have some sense for marketing and sales and business, and you have to be reasonably emotionally stable and et cetera, et cetera. It's very, very difficult. But if you are creative by temperament, well, that's you. That's and it. to not do that is to not be you. It's like ha asking an extroverted pe person not to be around people or an agreeable person not to engage in intimate relationships or a conscientious person not to be driven by duty. It's like, that's what you're like. And so, yeah, yeah you're stuck with it. It's a double-edged sword creativity. It's vital. It's yeah. entrancing. It's necessary. Um, it's transformative. It's disruptive. But it's a high-risk, high-risk, re high-return high game. And the probability of failure is overwhelmingly high. Even if you're an entrepreneur and, and, you know, more practically oriented in your creativity, the probability that you'll make money from your innovation or your invention rather than other people is very, very low. But, but you need to find a way. I mean, it's, it's also very difficult if you're a creative person to, to a lot of creative people don't think in practical terms. They don't think in terms of uh, money, actually. They're hopeless. A lot of them I, I know are hopeless in this No, stuff, they also tend fine. to be casually contemptuous of that to regard it right. as practical concerns as selling out. It's like you should be bloody happy if you have the opportunity well, to sell out. So I think that the, the, the ideal is to find a way to pursue your vocation, but have one eye on the reality that, you know, you will have to earn money somewhere or another. Yes, I mean, yes, that, I and I think it, it, it's, it's, that's why I think I'm lucky insofar as with Titania, I hit on something that had commercial viability, but it was very true to what I desperately wanted to do. And I think that's so rare. I think uh, uh, some of the stuff I've written, some of the plays I've written, for instance, I don't think would have any commercial success whatsoever, but I wrote them because I needed to write them. And, and, and some of them didn't even get on and maybe one day they will, and that would be great. But what right, if you well, just think of, what you have to accomplish though, right? You have to have, right your creative endeavor aligned with market demand at exactly that time. Right. It's, it's impossible. It, yes, and, and it's very, very unlikely. Actually, that's why I always say don't attempt to, to uh, anticipate the zeitgeist because you won't. You, like the best thing an artist can do is do what they believe and hope because a lot of it is luck. You yes, know I mean? Well, and if I mean, there's actually, there's a technical literature on that too. I mean, what 
essentially what you do is continue to produce ideas. And right. it's a Darwinian competition, essentially. They're like life forms, these ideas. And now and then one will find a niche that it can thrive in. But but the best way to uh, maximize your chances that that niche will manifest itself is to be um, is to overproduce. Because right. I look, yeah, for, right. I'll give you an example. I answered a bunch of questions on Quora. So that's a website where anybody can ask any questions and anybody can answer. I answered about 50 when I was playing with Quora. And mm -hmm. one of them was a list of everything people should know, of things people should know in their life. And I derived my books out of that list. Yes. Um, it was disproportionately successful. Most of the answers I generated got virtually no views, but it got it must be hundreds of thousands now, but even before I wrote the books, it was tens of thousands. But yeah. had I not written 50, I wouldn't have got that one. The other right. 49 failures, so to speak, were the, the, the answers weren't necessarily worse. They just didn't hit the zeitgeist like that, that answer did. And, and I think that's a great piece of advice over overproduction because. It's the same with the Beatles. They, 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 they look like an overnight success. It's because they'd been playing endlessly in those dingy clubs in, in Europe, you know, b before, before it happened. It's, it, you, you, you produce yeah, as much as you can. They say it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. That's, that's it. So it, you know, of, of most of the things I've written have done nothing and gone nowhere and had no success whatsoever. It's just, but, but the one thing, Occasionally, when it hits, that's that's what sustains all the rest of it. And it's, it's also it's, why creativity is, is is continues to be selected. Let's say from a biological mm. perspective, it's like that's why I said it was a high risk, high return game. Almost everything you do creatively will fail, but yes. now and then you're disproportionately successful, and so that keeps well, the whole game going. You didn't have any sense, did you, that when you put the lectures on YouTube that it would explode in this way? Did it, I mean, that was Not in this way. This was completely... I still, I, I'm still shocked constantly so by my well, life. The, I'm shocked <laughs> out, of, out of sanity by my life. I just can't... This is why I asked you about Titania. You know, you, you get at the center of a whirlwind like that, and there's something very surreal about it. And I mean, yeah. I, I keep getting hit by surreal things and it's very hard to wrap my head around it. Like this Red Skull episode was just <laughs> one of many equally surreal occurrences. But yes, it, no, I had no, I had no idea. I knew and, I was working on something important back when I was in my 20s, when I wrote my first book. And it yeah. was out of that that all my lectures came. And I spent 15 years working on that book and I worked on it about three hours a day. And so yeah. I, re I and I thought about it all the time. And so I knew there was something to it, not necessarily because they were my ideas, but because of the people who I had read and, and delved into while I was writing the book. I knew the ideas were significant. Uh, and and I could see the effect of the ideas when I was lecturing on my students. So I had some sense that there was something vital, that I was involved in something vital. But Sure. But, but had you uploaded those videos uh, a couple of years before or a couple of years later, you probably would have missed the zeitgeist and nothing would have happened. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I always think with any kind of creative endeavor or, in, or intellectual endeavor, it doesn't matter how good you are in a sense. It has to be good and the timing has to be right. And and like you say, if you just keep, I think persistence is it. If you just keep doing it, not only does your craft get better and, and you, you are, when, if it does hit, you're in a position to There's be able no to handle doubt. it. There's no doubt. Look, if you, if you, okay. So in, in scientific literature, the hallmark of impact is citations. And so mm -hmm. if your work is cited, it means that someone who's written another scientific article makes reference to something you wrote. And yes. that's all tracked and it's used for promotions and it's used to judge scientific merit. It's, 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 it's its own science, uh, citation tracking. Um, a very small number of your published papers accrue most of the citations. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing. So what that means is the more papers you publish, the more likely it is that one of them will become highly cited. And my highly cited papers aren't necessarily the ones that I thought would be most impactful. So, yeah. um, you, but the other uh, piece of information from literature on creativity is that the best predictor of quality, and so you could index quality by impact, let's say, or by citations, is quantity. Yeah. It's not a great predictor, but it's the best one. And so, and this is good advice for everyone out there who's a musician or an artist. It's like, 
produce, 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 produce as much as you can because you do get better at it, right? You absolutely do. And and so there's that, but there's also, I think the other important thing is to to actually be true to yourself in, in your artistic endeavors insofar as don't be trying to anticipate the design guys. Don't be trying to anticipate what other people are doing. I, I, my, my big concern in the current climate that we live in is that a lot of artists are choosing to self censor because the penalty for risk taking has got too high. Uh, you know, you can be completely, uh, I mean, if I think of well, an that's example, a, like, think about what kind of catastrophe that is, because we've already discussed the fact that the impediments to creativity are almost insurmountable. And so right. then you add an additional one, which is self-censorship because of social pressure. It's like you just decimate the creative enterprise by doing that. We wouldn't have anything. We, we, we The Western canon would be decimated. It's ridiculous. I mean, uh, an example I often think of is, is one of my favorite playwrights is Edward Albee. And when he came to write his play, The Goat, which was a very controversial play because it was about a man having an affair, a sexual affair with a goat behind his wife's back. And obviously that doesn't sound palatable. Well, at least um, he went beside, behind his wife's back. Exactly. At least <laughs> it wasn't sort of an open sort of paganistic thing. Absolutely. But um, he, I mean, it's it's a shocking play and it's meant to be. It's about uh, where our lines of tolerance are, where they lie and why. Um, and all of his friends told him, don't do this. You've got a, a valuable career, an incredible reputation. You're turning 80. You're 80. He was roughly 80 years old when this play came out. And they said, you're just going to scupper everything. And he said that one, when that he got that response, that's the reason he did it. He went out there and he, he put the play on and it turned out to be a huge success. It won, I think, the Tony Award for Best Play. It was critically and commercially successful. It was absolutely massive. So um, it just goes to show, I think, uh, to an extent, I mean, I'm not saying disregard uh, feedback from other creative people or people who, who, who have suggestions. But what I'm saying is if you're true to your muse, whatever that that is, uh, the rewards will come, actually, or, or they are more likely to okay, come. Okay, so that brings us back to free speech, too, because, you know, mm -hmm. the problem with laws that abridge free speech is they abridge creative endeavor. And that's a terrible thing because it's the source of endless renewal. And it it's the thing that does. fixes corrupt structures. And so to, to take aim at that is to take aim at the very process that would rescue you from the conundrum you, you, you are pretending to be obsessed by. I mean, has there been any innovation, not just in artistic terms, but in scientific terms, without the risk of offense, without, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned the example of Galileo in the, in the book, because, you know, he wasn't, he caused a great deal of offense by. Oh, hell, like, Darwin kind of like offended himself so badly that he, he, he was himself. sick. He was sick for like a decade because right. of the implications of what he'd thought up, which were exactly. thoroughly offensive to himself. As they would be in, a, in, 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 with his belief system at the time. And, and, but, but that's, that's the, we can see in hindsight what we would have lost if people weren't willing to risk offending others. In fact, even what you said to Kathy Newman in that interview about you're risking being offensive by disagreeing with me now in this way. Like it's, it's how it's important to risk offending people. It's because otherwise you just end up in this kind of, you know, this hive mind and, 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 and for the arts. It becomes utterly stultified. It becomes so boring when, when everything is predictable and everything is in line with a, a viewpoint and no one wants to, you know, the art is the best way that we interrogate the complexities of humanity. It's, 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 it, I, I love what sometimes what the filmmaker Lars von Trier, he said in an interview once that sometimes when he's making a film, he will take an indefensible moral position and attempt to defend it through the film, which I think is such a fascinating idea. Dostoevsky did that all the time in his great novels and so brilliant. I mean, it, that's what, what made Dostoevsky so staggeringly brilliant was he would take positions that he that he despised with all his soul and make the people putting those Believes forward the strongest characters in the book. I mean, he was so it's the brave. Best, it's the best thing to do. It's it's. Uh, I wrote a play once where I, I complete. I, it was a one man play where I completely tried to embody the kind of person I despise. It was someone who enjoyed, relished watching vi acts of violence, and he would take uh, 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 scour the internet for clips of real life violence. And it's something I could. You know, whenever I've had that, whenever someone's tried to show me a beheading or something, I've, I, I know I never want to see that kind of thing. I know I never want that in my head. And so I wanted to write a character who, who relished it, but from a position, uh, from a non judgmental posi position. I've never put that play on. I've written it. It's done. But, but, but the act of doing it was so incredibly liberating and interesting. Um, and the idea that you can, you know, you keep hearing this all the time. Um, you know, 
whenever a new film or a play comes out or a book, um, is this sending the right message? David Lynch's last series, the, the latest Twin Peaks series, was criticised. I read a review saying, well, there's violence against women in this and he needs to be called out for this. Well, representing violence against women isn't an endorsement of violence against women. You know, maybe that's what the character does and maybe we're supposed to hate him for it or whatever, or, you know. and Or if you read a, a, an autobiography of a complete reprobate, there can be something really interesting about that. And, and imagine all of this gone, all of this potential. But that is the end point of... of that's why I believe that this, this current social justice ideology is anti-art. I think it's, 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 it's opposed to the, the artistic spirit, quite, quite fundamentally opposed to it, uh, which is why I feel we must push back against it. So that's I went a off great on a place to there, end. But, no, okay. no, that's great. That's great. Well, thanks a lot, eh? Uh, yeah, much appreciated. Yeah, it was a pleasure and, and the time flew by, which is a good marker of a engaging exchange of free speech, let's say. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Jordan. My pleasure. Good luck, eh? Thank you.